What's going on? What's going on? I'm Marla Wilson, the host of the Gospel Truth. Thank you for joining me today. I have another great show for you. Um, with that said, I do. We do have a debate. I have Mr. Arn Raw with me and Mr. Eric Hernandez. And before they come on, and a lot of guys introduce themselves, I do want to encourage you to go ahead and like and follow the Gospel Truth. Please do that. Support, support, support. Like and follow God's Truth on YouTube and Facebook. And as always, make sure you hit that notification bell. Also, all this content is on podcast. So if you're a man or a woman who like debates, oh man, I got filled with them, man. So if you want to go ahead and check that out on iTunes, YouTube, uh, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, all those uh, pa- uh, podcast platforms, go ahead and check that out. With that said, let me bring these guys in. Mr. Eric Hernandez, Mr. Arn Raw. How y'all doing, fellas? What's going on with you? Good. Thank you for having us. All right. It's all right. All right. All right. Cool, man. So we're going to jump into this, man. Uh, and I'm going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves real quick. Uh, starting with Eric. You want to go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man? Uh, sure. My name's Eric Hernandez. I'm the apologetics lead for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. And I uh, just want to say thanks uh, to Marlon and Gospel Truth for hosting and for Arn for participating. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for coming on the Gospel Truth. All right, Arn, go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Sure. I'm Arn Ra. I'm an official representative of American Atheists, uh, director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project. I have a YouTube channel I do my activism on that has roughly a quarter million subscribers so far and i've been doing this for a little over a decade all right all right cool man i expect a great debate from you guys um i'm pretty excited about this one and i've been getting a lot of times a lot of people hitting me up asking me when this debate was going to happen so here we are man so the way this the, the topic of the debate is does the soul exist the format is 15 minute opening statements we followed by a five minute rebuttal then we got a 50 minute uh, cross examination. The first 30 minutes, both parties get 15 minutes to cross examine. And then after the final 20 minutes, both parties get 10 minutes uh, each to cross examine. Finally, after that, we have a 10 minute closing and then we'll follow that with Q&A from the audience. Sounds good? All right, Eric, yep. you're, you're arguing the affirmative in this debate, so you're up first. So if you want to go ahead and set up your slides and I'll let you know when we're ready. See. All right, let me pull that up real quick, Eric. Hold on one second. No problem. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. All right, Eric, go ahead. Take it away, man. You got it for 15 minutes. All right. So uh, the question for tonight's debate is, does the soul exist? And I want to start by giving you two things that this debate is not. First, this debate is not about religion or how people came to believe in the soul. Um, in the past, Arn said that people believed in the soul because they didn't know what air was. It doesn't apply to me, and that's irrelevant, and that would also be a genetic fallacy. So hopefully we won't get any of that. Second, the debate is not a scientific question. This is a case for a few reasons. First of all, it's a category fallacy. Um, the soul, if it exists, would be a non-physical entity, and science, by definition, is a discipline that can only study the physical. Thus, while science is a wonderful tool for investigating the physical world, it has virtually nothing to say about the non-physical. In fact, science in principle cannot even ask the question, much less answer it. Uh, some of the leading neuroscientists in the world, like Jeffrey Schwartz and Mario Beauregard, believe in the soul, and one can't say that they believe in the soul because they don't understand the neuroscience, given that these are some of the men that are l- the leaders in neuroscience. <clears throat> um, in addition, uh, any view that will be presented tonight regarding consciousness or the nature of the soul will be what is called empirically equivalent, meaning there is no piece of empirical data that one could give that would specifically lend support to one view over the other. Put differently, we'll agree on all the empirical data, but our conclusions that we draw from the data will be philosophical and scientific. This is because the questions uh, are philosophical questions about metaphysics, not science. 
As atheist philosopher of science Michael Ruse says, science does not ask certain questions, so it is to no surprise that it does not give certain answers. So appealing to science to answer the question tonight would be like appealing to a ruler to measure your weight for the assessment. The case that I'm going to give is just two basic points tonight. First is that consciousness is not physical. That is to say it's neither identical nor reducible to anything physical like the brain. And two, I am more than a brain and body. I am a soul. Now, a definition, what is a soul? The soul is an immaterial substance that contains consciousness and animates the body. Now, in order to understand that these two arguments, uh, it's important to first get a foundation and a grasp of what is called Leibniz's Law of the Indiscernibility of Identicals, and for short, we'll call it Leibniz's Law of Identity. Now, according to Leibniz's Law of Identity, if two things in question are the same, let's say some A and B, then whatever is true of one is going to be true of the other and vice versa. However, in principle, if you can show something true of one that is not true of the other, then it follows that the two are not the same thing. <clears throat> now, if there is no soul and uh, there is no God, then physicalism would be true, which is a view that human beings are purely physical objects, only purely physical properties and parts. Now, the reason this is important is because if Arne is going to show that there is no soul, then he's going to have to show that the mind is nothing more than the brain. That is to say, it is identical or reducible to say to the brain. However, if this is actually not the case, and in principle we can show something that is true of the mind that is not true of the brain and vice versa, then it would follow that the mind is not identical or reducible to the brain. And if that's the case, then it would follow that consciousness is not physical and physicalism would be false. Now, there are um, a good number of ways to show that this is the case. Um, excuse me. Uh, there, there are quite a number of ways to show this, and <clears throat> basically we'll just go over a few uh, for time's sake. Uh, using using Leibniz's law of identity, we can actually see that uh, the mind and brain are not identical because they share different properties. So, uh, for example, um, take the states of my mind and the states of the brain. Uh, my thoughts or beliefs can be true or false, but no state of my brain is true or false. In fact, in the past, Arn has called consciousness a physical function of the brain, but the same problem is that my thoughts, again, can be true or false, but a state or a function of the brain does, cannot be true or false. In fact, it doesn't even make sense, and I wouldn't even know what that means to say that a function is true or false. Um, I can hold beliefs to certain degrees, but I don't hold my neurons firing or brain states to certain degrees. My brain can weigh three pounds, but my belief that I'm speaking to Arn does not weigh three pounds. I can open my skull and look at my brain, but I don't open my skull and look at my thoughts because consciousness is a first-person private access kind of thing. So, in other words, while a neuroscientist can know more about my brain than I do, he can never know more about my mental life than I do. My brain can be seven inches long, but the smell of a rose or taste of a banana, which is in my mind, is not seven inches long. Uh, mental states have intentionality. My brain states do not. For example, when I'm hungry, my neurons aren't hungry. When I have an itch, my neurons aren't itching. Uh, these are mental states that are not characteristic of my brain states. Now, while there are many more examples we can go through, uh, it's clear and suffice to say that if the states and properties of the mind are not physical, and if all the properties of the brain are, are physical, then it would follow that consciousness, if it exists, cannot be something identical nor reducible to something physical like the brain, which would follow that physicalism would be false. Now, I want, uh, I want to point something out here, <clears throat> and that is that there is a difference between a cause or dependence relationship and uh, a relationship of identity. I want you to note that uh, this is important because Arn and I would both agree that if you mess with certain regions of my brain, it would affect certain states of my mind. No one denies this, and I want to make that clear. Nevertheless, it's important to understand that cause or effect does not establish identity. So, say for example, uh, you get a guitarist, and he gets an instrument like a like a guitar, and if a guitar string pops, it, he may be unable to play the music, and thus we have a cause and effect or a dependent relationship, but it doesn't follow that he is a guitar. Um, it could also be the case that certain parts of the guitar breaking would in, uh, inhibit him from playing the note C, but again, it doesn't follow that the note C is in the guitar, and that if you broke it open, you would find it. Uh, Again, all that to say that just because we can show a cause, effect, or dependent relationship between uh, a musician and his guitar or the notes in a guitar, it doesn't follow that they're the same thing. So while I don't deny, and on my view it's actually um, expected, that messing with states of my brain through various means can actually affect the states of my consciousness, it doesn't follow that they're the same thing. Why? Because as I mentioned in the beginning, cause or dependence is not the same thing as identity. 
So if Arn wants to show that consciousness is something physical, he's going to have to do far more than show that there's a cause effect or dependency relationship between the mind and brain. At the very least, he's going to have to show that they necessarily share all the same properties and that there is nothing true of the mind that is not true of the brain and vice versa. In other words, he's going to have to show identity. And unless he can do that, then for him to claim that consciousness is purely physical but would be something that he would have to take merely on blind pistis, a.k.a. blind faith. Now, uh, another thing to point out is uh, the irreducibility of consciousness, which I won't have time to go into detail, but atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel has pointed this out in his book that you cannot get mind from matter. And atheist philosopher Colin McGinn says that any naturalistic explanation for consciousness coming from uh, matter would border on sheer magic. So for him, he calls this magic. So if you're if you hear that word magic tonight, it's we're talking about something coming from matter, something like mind coming from matter, which these philosophers are saying is metaphysically impossible. Um, now, again, I, we don't deny that uh, there are correlations and cause and effects, but as J.P. Moreland summarizes another atheist philosopher, Jaguan Kim, saying that correlations are not explanations, but are in fact the very thing that need explaining. Um, and the problem is you can't simply rearrange uh, particles of matter and get some something like consciousness squared in, into existence any more than rearranging red bricks would give you the color blue or rearranging the furniture in my house would give you the color purple. This is just simply not something that you get by rearranging a physical structure. Uh, now, let's look at the second point that I am more than my brain and body, I am a soul. <clears throat> now, if uh, back to using again the law of identity, if uh, physicalism is true, then I am nothing more than a brain and body, and this would mean that I am a myriological aggregate, which is a collection of separable parts held together in a certain structure. However, if that's the case and I'm just a purely physical object, then whatever is true of purely physical objects like aggregates would be true of me, but we know that that's not the case. So let's just go over a few. One is the indivisibility of personhood. and it would go like this. I'm either a purely physical object or an immaterial soul. Purely physical objects can be divided and come in percentages or degrees. I cannot be divided or come in percentages or degrees. I'm an all or nothing kind of thing. Therefore, I am not a purely physical object. Therefore, I am a soul. To understand this argument, it's important to understand the notion of a degreed and non-degreed property. A degreed property would be things that can fluctuate or come in percentages or degrees. Take, for example, the property of being hard or soft or loud. Uh, such properties can be harder or louder or softer, so they fluctuate. Contrast that with a non degree property, um, something like the property of being even. The number two and the number six are both even, but it would make no sense to say that the number six is, quote, more even than the number two because a property of being even is an all or nothing kind of thing. It either is or it isn't. There is no in-between. Now, the property of being a person, if physicalism is true, would have to be a degree property that would be grounded in something like the brain and body. However, we know that's not the case because being a human person is not a degree property. In other words, you can cut a table in half and it would make sense to say you get 50% of a table, but it makes no sense to say that I cut a person in half, like my arms and legs, and I get 50% of a person. Consider the same with respect to the brain. There is a Dandy Walker syndrome or at and in symphony disease, where uh, some people only have 50% of a brain or 10% of a brain, well, they're not 10% or 50% persons, they're still 100% persons. Moreover, um, it's, it's also the case that men are typically larger than women, but just because men have more mass and matter than women, it doesn't mean that men are more valuable or, or are more persons than women, and I know Arne would agree with that. I have no doubt about that. Um, <clears throat> Moving on, we have identity through change. Um, now, aggregates do not retain identity through change, and we'll get to that in a second. But the argument is, I'm either a purely physical object or an immaterial soul. If I'm a purely physical object, then I do not retain identity through change. I do maintain identity through change. Therefore, I'm not a purely physical object. Therefore, I am a soul. Now, if I'm nothing more than a brain and body, uh, uh, according to what we've learned through science, um, every seven to ten years, you replace virtually every cell in your body. Um, there, it's, it's a little bit different with the brain, but you can still lose brain cells and whatnot. Now, um, suppose I committed a crime seven and ten years ago, but they just now find the evidence. Now, if the, the officers were to come to my house and say that, you know, we're going to arrest you because we just now found the evidence of a crime you committed seven to ten years ago, it would make no sense to say that, uh, officer, I'm no longer that person because given that we change, uh, I'm just a purely physical brain and body. I'm an aggregate, and aggregates do not maintain identity to change. 
Of course, he would laugh at me and slap on the cuffs. Interestingly, uh, philosopher Jaguan Kim that I mentioned earlier, he gives a, a similar argument to reflect on in his book. He says, uh, in 2011, this brain and body did not exist, but I did exist in 2011. Therefore, I cannot be identical nor reducible to this brain and body. And I would conclude on that. Therefore, I am a soul. Uh, next, we have an argument from free will. It would go as follows. I'm either a purely physical object or an immaterial soul. Two, if I'm a purely physical object, then I do not possess free will. I do possess free will. Therefore, I am not a purely physical object. I am a soul. Now, <clears throat> to understand this, it's important um, to, to first, let me say what free will is. Free will, I would define as being the originator or source of your will or actions. You're the first mover. Now, uh, Aristotle used an illustration. He said, if I move a rock with my staff, then you could say that the staff moved the rock, my hand moved the staff, but what moved me? Now, if there was no soul and there was no God, then the law of causal closure would be true, which states that every physical event must necessarily have a prior physical cause. So if uh, Arne wants to believe there is free will, he's going to have to somehow show that he is the first mover to his will or actions. Um, now, what you can say at this point is if you're going to say that your hand moved, you're going to have to point to something physical given the law of causal closure. You can say that your brain, a brain state, like a brain firing, caused your hand to move, that caused the staff to move, that caused the rock to move. But given that it was a physical event, you would still need a prior physical cause. At this point, you only have two options. You can get into an infinite regress of, of brain firings and physical events, but then that would mean that the action would never happen. Or at some point, you can point to something beyond the physical and say that something beyond you caused that brain firing to fire, which caused the hand to move, that caused the staff to move, that caused the rock to move. But then you're no longer the first mover. You're merely an intermediate secondary mover. Now, uh, that is to say, if all you are is something purely physical, you're not going to have free will. <clears throat> now, I don't know what Arn's position is on free will, but I will say this. If Arn... Uh, wants us to believe that he came to be an atheist uh, freely, that is to say he came to be an atheist based on uh, intellectual reasons, uh, and if he believes that religious people are morally accountable for their beliefs and for what they do, then he's going to have to posit something like a soul, because if you give up free will, you give up intellectual integrity and moral responsibility. Uh, so if Arn freely came to be an atheist, and if he wants to hold religious people accountable for their beliefs, then something like a soul must exist. So in summation, we can say that if consciousness exists, it can't be physical. If you're the same person from one moment to the next, you must be more than a brain and body. If men and women are equally valuable, then physicalism can't be true. And if Arn freely came to be an atheist and holds religious people morally responsible, then something like a soul must exist. Therefore, if we put all these together, we can say that here is a problem that Eris must face tonight. If he is conscious, if he is the same person at the beginning and end of this debate, if he is not above or more valuable than anyone, and if he freely came to be an atheist and is accountable for his actions, then it must be the case that physicalism is false, a soul must exist, and that would be the end of the debate. Thank you. All right, Eric, thank you for that 15-minute opening statement. All right, Aaron Ra, you are up for your 15-minute opening, man. Right. Uh, when the organizers of this debate invited me to participate, it was under a slightly different topic. It was suggested we would do, is there evidence of a soul? And I said then I couldn't resist this topic as long as we were only talking about scientific evidence, since nothing else would make any sense in this context. Because if we don't have empirical, verifiable facts, then what have we got? 13 television seasons of Ghost Hunter? where they still never found anything ever, and we know they never will, but they always pretend like they did in every episode? The best you could have is when something can neither be explained if true nor confirmed to be true in the first place, so there's nothing to explain. Besides, being unexplained is not an explanation. Yet, in the entire history of bewildering inanity claimed by spiritualists of every sort in any religion, none of them have ever shown even the slightest substance for their phantasms. No reason to believe that there was any, even a there there. Instead, what we typically always only ever see are empty assertions of impossible nonsense, or we find frauds, like when that toddler got rich and famous selling 10 million books claiming to have been to heaven in a near-death experience, only to admit years later that he lied, being coached by his parents. He's not the only example of those type hoaxes. Religion is rife with them and based on them. So I said to the organizers, all I ask is that Eric share with me whatever peer-reviewed articles he intends to source a week before the debate to debut, rebut them if I can, or at least confirm that they actually do say what he says they do. If they do, then I will have no choice but to admit that to you, the audience, when the time comes. 
But uh, I should never have to take an opponent's word for some cited study that supports their supposition because, to my experience, they usually don't. I often see scientific articles misrepresented in debates uh, when you, you, you finally get to the point where you can read it afterwards and you find out it really doesn't say or support what they said that it did. But you can't do anything about that when the first you've heard of it is during the debate and you can't comment on what you haven't read. However, Eric instead said that he wanted, he'd just drop the, the reference to evidence and change the topic of our debate to does the soul exist? So that we're no longer restricted to, required to have, or, or much, you know, much less allowed to share scientific evidence at all. And now, apparently, it's been precluded as a category fallacy. I thought you, the audience, should know that. So how do people come to imagine that we have an invisible spiritual version of ourselves hidden inside our physical bodies, driving them around like vehicles? If that were the case, there would be a way for science to determine that, even if the soul is supernatural. And yet the soul is supposed to be separate from our bodies, as if we could uh, abandon these material machines and become pedestrians or possess someone else's body and drive that around for a while or trade in your own body when it breaks down for a new model in the case of reincarnation. When I wasn't into paranormal mysticism myself, I used to think that material components had to be animated by a spiritual life force, essentially what George Stahl proposed in 1708 in his medical theory of animism, the foundation of vitalism, wherein life and disease were explained by an animating spirit inhabiting every part of the body, in which case it wouldn't just be people who had the spiritual component, but everything alive, including animals, plants, fungus, and even bacteria. In other words, if I have a soul, then so does a tree, so does an amoeba. If you have a soul, then your dog clearly does too. It's like when Obi-Wan Kenobi said that the Force is an energy field created by all living things, as if life is the spiritual biosphere enveloping and animating bits of the material world. Such was my belief at the time because I was conditioned by New Age hippie culture and fooled by our deceptive media, which talked about ectoplasm and parapsychology as if either of those were real. Of course, it turns out that this notion of living energy, the theory of vitalism, was disproved in 1828. There is no life force animating our bodies, and our current understanding of biology in the 21st century shows that there was never a need for such a thing. Our media likes to tell us that we're only using 10% of our brains, when in fact we use the full 100%. The basal portions regulate glands and bodily functions, process sensory input, enable motor control, and so on. But the number of neurons we have in the cerebral cortex, or gray matter, is the 10% of our brains that do the higher order thinking, whence our wisdom, intelligence, and personalities emerge. And this is what most people seem to have vision as their soul, what makes them them. While some enlightened spiritualists associate the soul with consciousness, as if the brain can't think or know anything without the soul inside it. Believers always imagine a man behind the, the curtain pushing buttons or pulling levers. Consciousness is just an awareness of self and, or a, a, a perception of surroundings. You don't have to have human intelligence to have consciousness. You really don't even need a brain for that, as there are simple animals with no brain at all and maybe no organs either that are obviously able to perceive and react to aspects of their environment without any neurons. There is even a unicellular organism that's demonstrated a capacity for memory and reason in laboratory tests, though few people would argue that a paramecium or a slime mold has a soul. It's just that having more sensory systems and a brain to better coordinate them gives you a greater awareness and higher consciousness. So the topic that always comes up is what happens when we're not conscious. I've actually heard spiritual leaders argue that when you're asleep and your mind, your mind travels to a metaphysical plane, they believe that dreams are real and that reality is a dream. But what if you're not just asleep? What happens when the brain gets shut down and seems dead but doesn't actually die and is somehow resuscitated later? This is when a small percentage of people suffering cardiac arrest or what have you may report a near-death experience, which in the U.S. tends to be described as a period of inexplicable perception where there is no detectable brain activity, yet the patient still has at least the ability to hear and remember what was said later. How does the memory function when there is no brain activity due to a lack of oxygen? I know that leukemia patients in an oxygen-deprived state shift into an unconscious phase where the body tries to minimize all costly functions in an attempt to preserve the brain for as long as possible. If this goes on for too long, leading to brain damage, then how did your supernatural immortal soul lose the ability to think properly? 
if we are just spiritual passengers in these physical vehicles, then it wouldn't be possible to change our personalities, propensities, or proclivities with chemical drugs or physical damage to the brain. Spiritual beings are separate from and entirely independent of physical or chemical effects. Yet, we know that drugs and surgery and other physical trauma can and definitely do affect who we are and how we think and feel, which all by itself should be evidence enough that there is no soul. While we don't yet know how this happens, I suspect that when the brain is extremely uh, stressed, the mind, which is produced by the brain, goes into something like a computer safe mode because biochemical systems like breathing and so on are controlled by the brain and yet still function even when the brain isn't showing any activity. During such times, a few of those people who report near-death experiences also report heightened perceptions that are impossible for the physical senses like out-of-body experiences. The reason I got into transcendental meditation when I was a spiritualist is because I was fascinated by out-of-body experiences, which I took to be first-hand observation of the spiritual world. I have to prove everything scientifically. I had repeatedly achieved the unmistakable vibrations at the initial stage of that, but I was never able to transcend the flesh to see my own body from outside. And more frustrating than that was whenever I interviewed other people professing to have had these experiences under various circumstances, I found that there was no consistency between their accounts, like there certainly would be if it were really real. On the same problem in peer-reviewed studies. For example, Jeffrey Long is a medical doctor promoting near-death experience research foundation. He published a paper to establish their reality by listing similarities, like the contrast of bright light with tunnel vision and the sensation of having found your happy place, which is not surprising given the extreme stress of an existential threat. But the paper also endorses dubious claims made in the anecdotal accounts of his patients, and it ignores important disparities that call, for the, uh, call all of the associated assumptions into question. For one thing, other studies report less consistency with some patients having terrifying experiences, too. Some patients report seeing the spirit of their dead father or something like that. But how did you recognize him if he didn't have his body? Why would a spiritual being look exactly like the body he used to operate? None of us look like our cars. Was your father's spirit naked? Well, of course not. Because in the spirit world, everybody has ghost clothes. A number of studies have shown that the description of near-death experiences differs significantly depending on that person's religious perspective. And one illustrative experiment involved the God helmet. Significant stress to the brain can be safely duplicated without being near death, such as being flung around in a centrifuge for astronaut training. Now, the so-called God Helmet is a device that electronically stimulates the brain in subtle ways. The most common reaction people have is the idea that another unspecified but intelligent presence is in the room with them. Now, some thought this was something like a ghost, a demon, or what have you, uh, or one person thought it was himself in an out-of-body experience. And Susan Blackmore, who claims to have been out of her body in the past, said that the God Helmet was a similar sensation and also one of the most extraordinary experiences she's ever had, apparently better than the real thing. However, famous atheist Richard Dawkins described only feeling slightly dizzy and quite strange, but otherwise pleasantly relaxed. This is consistently what happens as anecdotal religious claims are put to the test. They are found to be subjective, implausible, and not likely genuine experiences of anything supernatural. For another example, uh, near-death experiences reported by Hindus don't match what is typically reported by people raised in Abrahamic faiths. More importantly, Hindus report meeting their gods and so on during these experiences. You should read their accounts. They're quite different. I have a video where a Swami claimed that his consciousness ascended out of his body to meet his god, and he was even able to say how small the soul is and exactly what chakra the SIM card of the body goes in. A visiting journalist asked the Swami why it is that in near-death experience, Christians see Jesus, Buddhists see Buddha, and people of other religious faiths see whatever they expected to see. Because, you know, Hindus don't see Jesus and Christians don't see Krishna. There is never a revelation of spirituality that the subject did not already know and believe in, which indicates that mystic visions and near-death experiences are illusions that only accentuate preconceived notions. The Swami answered that people experience whatever they believe because that's just does one God taking many forms, so that ultimately there is no truth to the idea that one must accept Jesus to be saved or that there's a hell to be saved from. That's just what you were conditioned to believe in the Christian culture. He's able to make that judgment about y'all, but he's unable to recognize that he is only reciting what he was conditioned to believe because Hindus see near-death experiences as proof of their reincarnation from past lives. Everyone wants to believe Yoda, 
when he says, luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. But you know, Yoda was a Muppet. We are not in any sense separable from our physical forms. Everything that makes us who we are <laughs> is what we are. We know we have these bodies. We don't know that there is a soul, nor could we have. Uh, astrophysicist Sean Carroll and I argued a bit about when science can say that something is possible or impossible, and I gave him a number of absurd examples, and he would always say, well, it's highly improbable. Only when it came to the soul did Carroll finally say that we know for certain that doesn't and can't happen. He supports that with a rather impressive physics equation and an explanation of quantum field theory. In summary, he says that either some ill-defined metaphysical substance not subject to the known laws of physics interacts with atoms in our brains in ways thus far eluded by every controlled experiment in the history of science, or people hallucinate when they're nearly dead. What he's saying is that there's no possible way to remove your mind from your body because your body is the source of your mind. There is no theoretical or metaphysical model for how yourself, whatever that would be, could be in any sense you, yet not be both in and of your body. Not just somebody, your body. Your life experience has have built a network of, synapt of synaptic connections in your brain for everything you've learned through repetition and rehearsal and discussions and so on. These are physical formations that are literally connected to everything you know or remember. If you were to suffer a stroke, your thinking would be impaired. And, and you might be able to rebuild those connections to become fluent again. Most people never recover. But even if you could, that still proves that you were dependent on that cerebral mesh in the first place. Philosopher Daniel Dennett says that the mind is an emergent aspect of the body, not just one part of the brain, but the whole brain collectively, and really the rest of the body too. Even your endocrine system influences some portion of who and what you are, including your desires and aspects of your sexuality. Even if you could remove your mind and place it in someone else's body, it wouldn't be you anymore. Because your mind is not just data, and you're not just the things you know or remember. The neural pathways in that other brain would literally change your mind, forcing you to think differently. The new arms and legs would have different skills and talents than your old body did. And that other endocrine system would alter many of your preferences and your emotions, making you someone else. You wouldn't even recognize yourself anymore because you wouldn't be you anymore. You would be that other body. I don't, I don't know how I got managed to get through that with all the pandemonium of the dogs going crazy around me. That's just what happens here. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, for that uh, opening statement. Thank you both for your opening statements. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and go to a rebuttal round. Each person get five minutes to rebut their opponent. Starting with Mr. Eric Hernandez. You have five minutes uh, for rebuttal. Thanks. Um, yeah, all of that was irrelevant uh, to whether or not the soul exists. I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Uh, one thing, so I don't even know if I'll, I'll, I'll use five minutes. I might. Um, so he said that the uh, topic was dropped from uh, what it was initially. No, it wasn't dropped because it was never the topic in the first place. Um, Marlon presented a topic to both of us, and I'm guessing you replied first and said, yes, you're willing to do that. And I said, actually, I'd like to change it to this topic because I wanted Aaron to have to bury burden of proof and not just say I'm not convinced. And uh, I know that he's going to want to, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So yeah, it was never dropped. That was just never the topic to begin with. So um, given the topic that we have now, it's Arne's job to show why there is no soul and give a case for it. All I heard was a bunch of assertions and empty claims. I didn't hear any evidence behind that, um, but maybe we can get into that with the cross-examination. Um, <clears throat> so he bears a burden of proof to, to show something. He said uh, he's looking for empirical evidence. I, I, I we're going to, I'm sure, get into that later because I'm curious to what empirical evidence there is that the the that the brain thinks and that the brain knows things like he asserted. Um, he mentions he mentioned Sean Carroll. Sean Carroll is not a, an expert in the philosophy of mind, nor is that his field. He can talk about that, but that's not uh, telling me what Sean Carroll thinks would be like uh, me uh, quoting to you what uh, a street preacher is saying and showing, hey, look at the street preacher. Here's why he says evolution is false. And I know you would laugh at that. So uh, quoting Sean Carroll to me regarding philosophy of mind would be like me quoting a street preacher to you regarding evolution. Um, he talked about Dennett. Dennett actually denies consciousness. Him and John Sorrell, uh, both atheist philosophers, both atheist philosophers of mind. John Sorrell, I think, really uh, showed him uh, where he was wrong. And But 
uh, de denies consciousness and, and appeals to some type of an eliminative behaviorism, which is a type of physicalism. Arne didn't tell us which of the five versions of physicalism he holds to, which is a little bit odd to leave out in a debate on the soul. Uh, he didn't provide a case for why there can be no soul or what his position is on the soul, other than, again, just mere assertions. Um, he says that if you if you were put in another body, you would think differently and it would change your emotions and your preferences, and that would make you literally a different person. Interesting. So he seems to concede my point that you're not one person from one moment to the next. So I'm wondering at what point does he change uh, and become literally a different person? Is Arn a different person than what he was yesterday because he now has a different set of beliefs and thoughts and memories? Um, is he literally a different person than when he was five? So he wasn't he's not the same person that developed and grew. No, it was literally someone different. That's that's quite strange. But I'll let Aaron defend and talk about that. Uh, maybe when we get into some cross examination. Um, there really wasn't much to me to talk about. He talked about, you know, ghost hunters and, and some other things that have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not, uh, um, the soul exists, anything re with regards to what I said. So I guess it still stands. And I know that, and I want to be fair, uh, that was his opening statement. It wasn't a rebuttal to mine. So I'm not trying to say that. Uh, I am interested in hearing what he's going to say for a rebuttal, but again, it was largely irrelevant. And, um, I'm curious how much he prepared for this debate, uh, because I was hoping to hear some arguments against it. And, even though I believe in the soul, I can give plenty of arguments why people think uh, or would support physicalism, and I can give you the different five versions of physicalism, but I heard none of that from Arn. I just, again, heard a lot of assertions. Sean Carroll and Daniel Dennett were the only two people that I can think of that he mentioned. I mentioned uh, four or five philosophers, most of them atheists. Um, so, yeah, there's not really much for me to respond to there. I, I'll concede the rest of my time. All right. Thank you, Eric. All right, Arn, you're up for your five-minute rebuttal. Yeah, when Eric opened uh, right away, my, my first thoughts as he started getting into this was I thought that there was going to be some substance and literally everything he said was irrelevant to the point. I did not make any assertions. All I did was give data and what we should expect and predict if, if, uh, from experiments and so forth if there was a soul and the evidence, evidence, not assertions, that stand against there being a soul. And it well, doesn't matter that Sean Carroll's name is Sean Carroll or what, he, what, what his position is. It was the reason why he made the argument. It was the, the value of the argument because it makes sense and it is sound. Now, as far as, uh, as Daniel Dennett, uh, Daniel Dennett and uh, Patricia Churchland described consciousness as the ebb and flow of neurons inside a healthy human brain, meaning that the mind really does emanate from and is generated by the brain. And, you know, this is according to uh, Dennett, who is, of course, a cognitive side is specializing in the philosophy of mind. So I'm surprised if he's completely changed his position since then. Then uh, I'm interested in how um, Eric has automatically dismissed the idea that all inconclusive data or all data is going to be inconclusive by uh, a definitional fiat. But again, I had the same impression of Eric's argument that he had of mine. I uh, did I saw his, everything he said as being irrelevant. He was trying to he's trying to weigh into philosophy. He said he said that a soul is immaterial substance, which is a contradiction in itself. The, the words don't even make sense together, right? There there would be a way to verify if we actually had a soul. There's lots of different ways we could do that. We can't just say that it's mystical, magical, whimsical, and you can't touch it. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. There's a curtain. We there we can look behind it. It's that simple. You know, to challenge physicalism, er, you know, the physicalism is the, is the mutually held idea that there is a physical reality, and you know, minus the empty assertion that there's some alternate reality on top of that. So we both accept that the one that we really have. If Eric wants to propose that there is that physicalism is not true, well, then what he has to do is he has to show well, that there's this also this alternate reality on top of that, or in addition to that, and he didn't. He he just he he does his uh, you know his special definitions that, that we have something that's mystical and believe and 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 we we can't ever touch it and and science is prohibited from even thinking about this, which I think is invalid. Also, then anyone you mentioned about free will, there there was a number of interesting things. I don't uh, I'm not sure about free will myself. I understand that there's still some arguing about that, but I always thought that if you uh, I may not have free will. I don't think that I necessarily do, but uh, I know that for a Christian who believes that there's a, a being who foretold our existence in the future, I know that you can't have free will. There's places throughout the Bible where, where the, the conditions set do not allow free will. 
So I don't even understand why why Christians argue for that point. It's obvious they can't have it. Not just that they don't, but they can't, logically. And and one other question is if, if men well I get, I'll save that for the question and answer period. And I can see the rest. All right. Thank you both for those rebuttals. All right, so now we transition to a cross examination round. Uh, so once again, it's a 50 minute cross examination. First 30 minutes, each person get 15 right. minutes. Final 20 minutes, each person get 10 minutes to ask questions. All right, starting with you, Mr. Eric, you have 15 minutes to cross examine on. Right. Thanks. Um, so you're saying that consciousness is generated by the brain, is that right? Not just by the brain. That consciousness okay, go on. is. Consciousness exists below the brain. It's just when you have a brain, you have more sensory apparatus, you have more cognitive functions, you have a higher awareness, a higher consciousness, or more awareness than a higher consciousness. But I mean, or even organisms that don't have a brain still have consciousness. So you can have and consciousness without a brain? Yes. Interesting. Okay, so then you shouldn't have no problem with uh, belief in God being an unembodied mind. Um, can you describe to me what a pain is in purely physical terms? What a what is? What is a pain? Which is a it's a state a of consciousness. Pain? It's a sensation. Yeah, describe okay. pain in purely physical terms. P a i n. Right when it hurts. Is that what mm -hmm. you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's that's one that, that's one of your your sensory apparatus. That's one of the 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 simple ones. Like um, I mentioned one of these experiments that well, wasn't it actually an experiment it was an observation that fit this. There was paramecium. Don't have any neurons at all. And yet they can detect the chemical signature of a of an enveloping amoeba, and it causes a fight or flight response with panic mode, where they set and then takes off. Now, it, from you know natural selection, anything that has a protective system. Can you tell me what a pain to, is? That's what I'm doing. That's what you're interrupting. So, you have it, it's a sensory apparatus that lets you know that you are in danger, that da damage is being done, so that you can react to that. It's, I'll just simplify it for you. Okay, so you're describing pain behavior, but that's not pain. Because I can have pain behavior without pain. Pain behavior isn't what makes a pain a pain. What makes a pain a pain? The very thing that I just said. It, it is the response to damage being done. It is the way you are being alerted to that damage being done. We perceive that as pain. So again, you're so you're you're doing what Dent does. You're 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 giving a behavioralist account, but that doesn't describe what pain is. How do you know you're in pain? May as well just ask me what a color is. Again, it is our perception. Can you describe that in a physical term? What what is a pain? Is a pain in the brain? Would you like me to repeat the explanation that I already gave that that answers the question you're asking again? No, because I didn't answer the question. Is pain in the brain? Is a thought in the brain? Once again, since we have this, uh, th this is being evident in organisms that don't have a brain, then no, it's not just in the brain. Though in us, it, it centralizes in the brain. In organisms that don't have a brain or even a neural network, it has to go somewhere else or is body-wide. Where is a thought? Where is a thought? As I said, uh, the higher order thinking, what we would recognize as thoughts, is in the cerebral cortex, the 10% of our brain where our neurons are. So, so you said uh, a, a Consciousness is, is, it's a function, it's something the brain does. How can a function be true or false? What? How can a function be true or false? Does it function? Yes, equals true. No. No equals how, false? How can a function, how can a function be true or false? So when I flush my toilet, that's a function, but that's not true or false. Okay. So how can a thought be a brain function? If a thought can be true or false, and it's a, it, it's a property of a thought to be true or false, it's not a property of a function to be true or false. If you're going to okay, say a thought so, is something physical in the brain, it's going to have to share so those physical properties. So you're, you're saying if you can think something and be wrong, that means what? That it's not a physical state or function. Okay, so you flush your toilet. How does flushing your How is flushing your toilet true or false? Well, that's my point. It's not. Which would mean that okay. consciousness is not reducible nor identical to the brain or a function of the brain. Okay. So if, if the flushing your toilet cannot be true or false, then did you fl I don't understand what is the, what is the, even the point of the question. 
Okay, Does that so, mean your so this is what you're saying. So this is your toilet well, the flush. Um, well, I'm, I'm asking the questions here. So, then, well, then, I'm asking the I'm asking I'm asking the questions. So, so this is this is odd that you come to debate on consciousness and the soul or the soul, which deals with consciousness, and you're not familiar with these types of categories of terminology. So, as I mentioned in my argument, which was evidence, deductive logic is evidence, showing that if the mind is reduced or identical to the brain, they're going to share the same properties. If they don't share the same properties, they're not the same thing. For you to say that consciousness is physical, you're going to have to show me that all the properties of the mind are identical or reducible to something physical like the brain. I haven't heard and that. Can you, can you do that? I'm sorry? But I think I already did that. How'd you do that? When you asked me what a pain is, and I explained what a pain is, and you said I didn't explain what a pain is, even though I did, and then you said that... that, that, that your, your pain cannot be true or false, which means flushing the toilet cannot be true or false. I don't understand no, what you're no, trying to do. Well, yeah. I, I can see that. No, so so the, the you, what you described was what someone does when they're in pain, but describing pain behavior did not describe pain. There is an intrinsic qualia to pain itself. Right. It's how we perceive the damage being done through our our sensory note. That that is the answer. That is what a pain is. It's the indication of damage that we perceive through our our receptors. Literally, that's so what, what it is. It's it's dam okay. It's perceived damage. So, perception is that something physical? Yes. How does a brain function perceive? Well, I'm not a neurologist. I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly how these neurons affect, or you know, the 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 network of sensory receptors and how they're interconnected. But I know that if you damage something in the body, then the body does send a signal, and the signal is received and interpreted as pain. Pain is the perception of that damage being done. And yes, it's physical. I think Eric dropped out. Um, let me see if I can get him back. All right, Eric, uh, we left off. You had about seven and a half minutes left. Um, so we can continue there and progress forward. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, like I was saying, you described pain behavior, didn't describe pain. Um, we're talking about thoughts. Now, if a uh, property of being a thought can be true or false, but no part or function of my brain is true or false, and that alone would show that they're not the same thing. Now, do you agree or disagree with that? I disagree, of course. Yeah, and I didn't describe Why? the pain response. I described the pain, that the pain is defined as that sensory input that we perceive that way. That is what that is. What is. So that, can you have pain, pain behavior response. without pain I didn't pain? I didn't show. I didn't explain how we respond to that. I said that that is, you know, we perceive this input. The, the pain is the indicator that damage is being done. It's, you know. And and the indicator is it not that there's a felt quality to what pain is? Yeah. Okay, that's qualia, which is something didn't denies, and which is something that's not physical. Okay. How is it not when you touch something? Obviously, that's physical. You touch something forcibly. <clears throat> you you right. alert, alert so, so that these nerve cells would then respond to send this chemical signal, which, you know, chemical is physical. And right. So you, so you react, you realize that there's a pain sensation. All of this is entirely physical. What What's not physical about that? So uh, well, well, the pain itself is not physical. There, there may be inputs and outputs that are physical what that may cause something, but does it doesn't mean the physical. pain itself? Well, the very pain what itself. Pain uh, the, the very, the very qual the qualia. Itself. Are you familiar with qualia? Yeah, yeah, everything we just qualia? described, everything that pain is, is physical. So what's not yeah, okay. physical about that? Well, you can't describe pain in a physical sense. Okay, so can you have pain behavior you without actually being in pain? You only describe pain in a physical sense. Which you haven't done. You talked about, uh, you, you said there's a perception. Okay. Okay. You said there's a perception. What are you perceiving? You're perceiving pain. Now, you talked about uh, also, uh, you, which is something I already mentioned in my opening, about cause and effect relationships. Just because you can show cause and effect relationships doesn't mean it's something physical. If fire causes smoke, it doesn't mean that fire is smoke. 
Just because there's something that I can I can detune in my guitar, it affects the way I play the music. Doesn't mean the music is inside my guitar, that the note C is inside my guitar. So I don't know why you think it would be relevant to bring up cause and effect relationship to show that consciousness is not physical. I mean that to show or to try to indicate that consciousness is physical. Well, I thought we were having a different you, debate. I, I thought the purpose of the debate tonight was that we were supposed to say whether there or not there is a soul, in which case you were mm -hmm. supposed to present some reason to believe that there is a soul. And having that right. you didn't do that, I I'm, I'm think my work is done here. I'm confused. Why are we continuing? <laughs> I don't think you've, you've done any work. So let's go to free will because you mentioned that. So um, you said you don't think you have free will. Is that right? I'm not certain about that. Okay, so it seems like you're trying to make a rational decision, which is an indication that you're free to come to that decision in the first place, are you not? Oh, it would seem so, yeah. I mean, we certainly have to treat people as if they have free will. I mean, the legal system wouldn't work if we didn't. But, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, I understand that the reasons that I make the decisions that I do are largely based on my, my past experience. And you can predict, if you know somebody well enough, the decision that they're going to make in a given situation, even if it's the wrong decision that they're going to make that decision because that's what their indications are. That's so, so yeah, right. Okay. So, uh, whether or not free will exists, if you're, so you would, so you don't believe there's a soul, you believe you're something just physical. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Then as I argued, you can't have free will because every action, thought and belief is causally determined by prior external factors beyond yourself. So you can't have free will if there's no soul, which means and that your you very belief to be an atheist and, so you're very believed to be an atheist, soul. and so so you're very believed to be an atheist, and your belief to not believe in the soul was not a free decision that you came to make. It wasn't even a rational decision because there was no free will. So your beliefs are no more rational than the religious person on the street, you know, saying that the world is flat and that the earth is young. Except that I have reasons to hold the position that I do, which is why I hold the position that I do. That whereas reasons you that you are causally to free will either because you can't have free will. <laughs> Because you have reasons that you were causally That's determined, nice. reasons reasons that you were causally determined to believe, right? You 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 yeah. were not free to believe that you have no free will. You did not freely believe that, right? I think you're pushing free will beyond where it needs to be. I can change my mind when given evidence that that I am incorrect, as has happened before. That's what we should do. That's what makes us honest. But. You, you, there is some point when you realize that when how open you are to this or whether you're inclined to make a given decision really is based on your past experiences and who you are, how you were raised and something, a lot of other things. But it doesn't mean that so, I'm constrained or prohibited from making the right decisions or from being rational in them. So, well, let me ask it this way. Do you really kind of believe the that there's no free will? The rationality actually has no relevance in this argument. Did you really come to believe that you have no free will? I don't want to have to repeat the same explanations over and over again. So suffice it to say that, yes, I freely came to believe that I have no free will because I'm not conflating these things the way you evidently are. Well, you can ask me. I'm, I don't know how I'm conflating that. But, okay, so you freely came to believe you have no free will. And if that's the case, if you do have free will you. and intellectual and integrity and you can ask me that when it's your turn intellectual integrity or more responsibility if you have these things and you have to have something like a soul otherwise the law of cultural closure would be true and every why? physical event would, would have a have physical a cause why would you have to have a soul because why all you have that does, that so, yeah so I, you know, so, so, so I guess you didn't follow the so 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 i guess you didn't follow the argument um, given the law of cause or closure, every physical event must have a physical cause. Your brain firing, which is what you're going to say, all thoughts, beliefs, and actions are nothing but neurons firing. That's going to be caused well, no, by some prior that. physical I event. I didn't actually. I said more. I didn't actually. I, I said many times, very explicitly, that it's more basal than that. It's something physical. It is. Right. Right. Yes. Which is going to be it necessarily is, caused by being, some. When a physical being has all these indications that it makes the decisions that it does because of its training or conditioning or, or whatever it might be the effect, still has the ability to make a rational decision given evidence to do so.
It's causally determined by external factors beyond its control. So uh, let me ask you about this. You, so I, I, I think I know the answer to this. So it might make a rational decision so, given so, the reason to do so. So, okay, thank you. So I'm sure you would agree with this, but I, I, I want to get this clear. So you wouldn't, I know you wouldn't believe something like men are more valuable or more persons than women, correct? No, that was a, that was one I wanted to ask you about because I did not catch what your assertion was with that. When you said if men and women right. are equal, the soul cannot exist. What? All right, that's time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not. That's, that's, that's not. That's time right there. All right, Arn, all right. It is now your fifteen minute opportunity to cross examine Eric. Yeah, I, I'm, I can tell you, I'm not going to need fifteen minutes. But we'll just start with the with that first one. If men and women are equal, then physicalism can't be true. And again, physicalism is I assume that you and I both accept that there is a physical world. So physicalism is what you and I both accept minus the other thing that you were supposed to come up with and show that you didn't. So still waiting on that. But um, you said that if men and women are equal, then physicalism can't be true, meaning that there's some supernatural thing. Why? Yeah, so I didn't say that. Um, I. I, I don't know where in the world you got that. The point was actually the opposite. Oh, if yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you thought there was a there was there were dogs going crazy behind me, and then uh, it, it was a little difficult to catch everything. I admit. So, what did you say? Right. So, what I did say was that so being a person, the property of being a person, I would argue is a non-degree property. It's an all or nothing kind of thing. Now, if there's no soul, you're going to have to ground this in something physical like the brain and body, which does fluctuate and can come in percentages or degrees. So, if all you are is a physical brain and body, then being a person would in principle be, be a degree property that can fluctuate, which means someone who has more mass and matter would either matter more or have more value or be more persons than someone who has less mass or matter. Given that men are typically larger than women, if physicalism is true, then you have more mass and matter, which would indicate more personhood and value. But I know you wouldn't agree with that, so you would have to reject physicalism. Uh, you also mischaracterize physicalism. Wait, wait, which why, is wait, odd. How is it really? How was that ridiculous argument? I mean, that's a complete non sequitur. How did you then throw in the, the unrelated aspect of, the, of physicalism? Okay, so this is this is this is odd. You don't know what physicalism means. Th these are philosophical terms. It's a philosophical topic. Yep. It's philosophy of mind, and physicalism yep. is a view that human beings are purely physical objects composed of purely physical properties and parts. That's the definition of physicalism. Yeah, I understood that. I understood that. Okay, so you said we agree on that. We don't agree on that. Well, we both agree that there is a physical universe. Yes. Yeah, but you, you can't equate, you, you're equivocating, okay, so saying physicalism. physicalism and equating that with physical stuff. Tell me again, tell me, tell me again what physicalism is. It's, it's the belief that we have only the physical world. Is that right? It, it is, it is, it is a, uh, a position regarding the existence and nature of human beings, that human beings are purely physical properties and parts. So it is what I just said. It is that we have only the physical world. So we both accept that there is the physical world, and you want to assert that there is some no, other. No, 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 no. Uh, we don't. We don't. It's it's the view that that is all there is to human beings. We don't both accept that. I believe in the soul. Right. Why would you? Why would you say that I would accept we, that? We both accept that there's a physical universe, right? Right. Physicalism is a regard of human persons, not the universe. And is that That'd a be yes more like or naturalism or materialism. Okay. Is that a yes or is that a no? Do we both accept that there's a physical mm. universe? Yes, but that's not physicalism. Okay. okay, then once again, the physicalism is the belief that you have the, this aspect of humanity is purely physical and that there is no soul to it, right? So then the purpose then of this debate is for you to present a, a reason to believe that there is this additional component to what we know we already are. <coughs> and so I've been waiting for you to do that. Know that and what you gave well, okay. So, I mean, is neither true or false. Well, that's to show the non identity of con. So, there were two points I made consciousness is not physical, and I'm more than a brain and body. I'm assuming you disagree with both of those. Is that correct? Of course. Okay, so if consciousness is physical, you're going to have to demonstrate that every mental state and property is, is identical to every physical state and property. But if I can show, which I have, that there are mental states and properties Wait. that are not reducible or identical to any physical states and properties, it would show that consciousness that is not physical. If maybe maybe dogs were making noise in the background, but I didn't catch that part. 
Yeah. When did you do that? So there are things. <clears throat> there are things true of so. Okay, you have mental states and properties that are not identical to anything physical. So something physical is something that can be described purely in the language of chemistry and physics. You cannot do that with conscious states. Uh, you mean like when a, you look an, an immaterial substance. So, so that's even off. another thing that's 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 odd. It's almost it's almost embarrassing because for you to say that is for you to show that you don't know even the history of, of that term substance. It was first used by philosophers, okay. and then science got a hold of it later. So, a substance is not something necessarily tied to science and something physical. It has a rich history of it, and for something to be a substance, there there's. Uh, a certain views of substance like identity through change uh, um, indivisibility things of that nature okay and immaterial means not physical not material so a not a non-physical substance so immaterial means non-physical what does non-physical mean yeah something that's going to take more than the the language of chemistry and physics to describe Okay. Having properties have beyond the physical. Because so, so far as I know, nobody's ever defined what the hell this is. I mean, it, it's always something well, nebulous that you can never touch it. But my understanding is that a soul. <laughs> Why would you be able to touch something non-physical? Right. I wouldn't assume such a thing. I wish you wouldn't imply that I had. You just said it's something you can't touch. Well, of course. Right. Of course. So I obviously didn't assume you could touch it. But your argument with the soul is that we have this thing that can't touch the physical universe, or the, maybe it can touch the physical universe. I don't know, because we never got a definition from you. So somehow this mystical, ghostly, whatever it is that is, remains undefined, uh, exists inside us and apparently drives our bodies around. I mean, am I, are we on the right track? I mean, do we need to define what a soul is before we argue about it? Well, I did. I mean, I... <laughs> I mean, I'm almost tempted to ask if you're paying attention to my opening. I, I did define what a soul was. Let me have a slide you for it. You said a material substance. Uh, that contains consciousness and animates the body. Yeah. So basically, it's it's the, the man behind the curtain pushing buttons and, and throwing levers rather than the the complex functions of the brain and, and biochemistry. It's always It always oh, has absolutely. to boil down to the right. man behind the curtain in some way. But it, All right, it, that, because a, a brain function... Uh, uh, you're really just pushing brain the argument. Function. You're pushing the argument back because what, what causes the soul to be able to think? If you if you discount that the brain can think, even when we can show how the brain actually does think, then you want to say that the soul is doing the thinking for the brain. Well, how does the soul do the thinking? Okay, hold on. So you're saying that the brain can think. So I don't. I have no idea how we would show the brain thinks. Um, so this gets into already something I said about first person private access. I know there's a lot to go through, but if you're going to be doing a debate on this and you're not coming prepared to even at least have the basic terminology and knowledge of the arguments for the soul, then it's going to be really hard to kind of have a good discussion if I'm going to keep having to explain certain terminologies and concepts. So uh, okay, well, first person private access. Just help me out with this then. When did you give a reason to believe that a soul exists? How did you phrase that? So the first, the two basic points, and I gave arguments for each of those. The non-identity, the non, the non, the the non-identity regarding Leibniz's yeah. law of the indiscernibility of identicals. Neither, your toilet flushing is neither true or nor false. Out of all so that, the only thing you heard was toilet flushing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I gave, what I gave is if you want to propose that there is actually a body or that, excuse me, that there's a, there's some kind of mystical, as yet still undefined something or other. And what I meant when I said, when you can't touch it, you can't even describe it. You can't even define it, right? That's supposed to be this nebulous, whatever that's uh, inside of us in some way or however you want to describe it. I don't know because I'm coming up with all the all the explanations and definitions here that's supposed to be driving our bodies. Well, then there would be certain things we would expect of this immaterial thinker that's thinking where the brain doesn't think, even though it looks like the brain is thinking. And we know that we can damage the brain and change how it thinks. And that doesn't make sense. If the brain isn't thinking, then how did we stop the thinking when we damaged the brain? Well, the same way, just like the note C is not inside a guitar, if you detune it or pop strings, you're not going to be able to play the note C. It's not a hard concept. Okay. But if we're talking about a soul being inside a body, then would it be fair to do an analogy where you're driving a car? Does that make sense? Does that work at all? Mm -hmm. Your perspective yeah. of having a soul in here? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the soul 
the, 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 the car loses a headlight and, and you're suddenly blind? I mean, what, what happens? If, if, what, it, what is it about the, the car the, the car receives damage and then the immortal soul, which is completely independent of that, is somehow damaged in the same way? Does that make sense to you? So, uh, I get what you're saying, if that's what you mean. So, um, I didn't argue about the soul being immortal. That wasn't part of my argument. But you're on the right track in that there is a cause and effect a correlation between that. But correlations are not explanations, as atheist philosophers so like would argue. Be so, if so, what what can be damaged is the instrument the soul uses. I cannot damage the note C, but I can damage a guitar and a piano. I can damage the keys associated so and correlated with the it. Brain doesn't think. But if you have a stroke, as I mentioned in my presentation, that impairs the ability to understand things, even though there's a soul that is, is the one doing the real thinking, according to you. Suddenly the soul can't think. Well, why is that? The soul is independent of that. The soul didn't get a stroke. The body did. And if the brain isn't when did doing I say the soul thing, it's irrelevant if it had a stroke or not. Uh, no, no. So, yeah, I, I never said the soul is independent of the body. Uh, I'm a substance dualist, and there's a deep integration for it, and I hold to a reducing view of the soul, uh, which is which. I don't even want to open up okay. that can of worms. We're, but it's we're very hot up the description of physicalism, meaning that we we that physicalism is that the humanity is only this other this thing, and then you've mentioned that the soul is independent of that. That it's completely separate. I, in I some never respect. said it's I, that it's one I never said the soul and one's immaterial. I said it's not identical or reducible to. Those are okay, technical so metaphysical terms. Body, Says who? I'm asking you. You just said I think the soul it can, but that wasn't. I, I I think. I never. You said the soul. I think it can, but that wasn't part of my. I think it can, but I never. That wasn't part of. The soul can be independent of the body. I think the soul can exist disembodied. Yes. Okay, can the can the can the soul go go on to another body? Um, I think it's metaphysically possible. How Not do we know it. what it? How do we know if anything is metaphysically possible? Oh, very nice. How do we determine? So, uh, is, can you give me an example of something that is metaphysically <clears throat> impossible? Metaphysically impossible? Yeah, uh, the number two being the color purple or weighing five pounds. Okay, so we have essentially the same logic in metaphysics then. I don't understand the question. Okay, so you said it, it was metaphysically possible. How do you determine whether something it, is metaphysically possible? Oh, gotcha. Right. So, um, so first, there ha there can't be a logical contradiction to it. Um, it has to be, in some sense, actualizable. Uh, uh, it can't be a category fallacy. Kind of you asking for scientific empirical evidence for a non-physical, not uh, a then material why thing. So, metaphysical? I'm sorry. If the way that you determine whether something is metaphysically possible is the same way that I would determine whether something is physically possible or logically possible, then what? why add the adjective metaphysical? <clears throat> right. So there are some things that are logically possible that wouldn't be metaphysically possible because uh, logically possible is a lower bar than metaphysically possible or actualizable. So, for example, it's uh, it's in, in technically metaphysically possible for the prime minister to be a prime number because there's no in, uh, ex, uh, blatant, explicit logical contradiction. But okay, I would say so it's metaphysically impossible arguing. for that to be the case. But neither of us are arguing for these kind of impossibilities. This debate comes down to. We both accept that there are physical beings, and you want to say that there's another aspect to it. And I'm looking for the reason that we should believe that there's another aspect to it. What I presented is things that would be inconsistent with that, where we show that the body can possess this ability. Even without a brain, the body can possess this ability. How did you show ability. that? When I talked about the paramecium and the slime mold that, or, that demonstrated reason and memory, in laboratory tests, even though they're unicellular organisms with n without any neurons. Yeah, but so you so, would have to, so you're saying you can, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'm saying that, that what we have is a consistency, right? We, we know that there's no aspect of the body that, that needs a soul to drive it. The, the body's fully functioning all on its own without a soul. The brain the brain has these abilities, and we know that we can impair those abilities. We know we can improve these abilities. We can certainly significantly change them in a number of ways. So where is there an indication, then, that the soul is even there or necessary? When, you when the brain has a stroke, the soul 
soul somehow loses the ability to think. That's if that's inconsistent. Or when you improve a medical condition. That's when you have a, when you have a bi when you have the split brain thing and you and, and you and you you're unable to feel what's in your your left hand because you're you're reading from the right brain and you're not looking at it. You're just going by sensory. Why would that? A soul would not have that dysfunction, right? So no. So for some reason, so I, I'm wondering if you understood any of my arguments that I gave. You keep saying I didn't present anything. I, I, I did present it. You haven't interacted with him. You just okay. made some yeah, assertions. I'm, I'm just but, a terribly stupid person. That's that's my whole problem. I'm completely beneath uh, you know, normal cognizance. But help me out here. When did you give a reason to believe that there's a soul, or when did you address any of the things that I said about what we should expect to be consistent if there was a soul that aren't consistent? Okay, so. Like the out of the okay. out of body experiences and so forth. I mean, I, that's what I question. really thought. What's that? Well, I said, well, you asked me a question. Are you going to another question? Um, so no, the non identity, the, the non identity of conscious okay. mental states versus any physical brain states. Um, if you have free will, if you're if you are uh, indivisible as a person, uh, if you remain the same through change, then you have to be more than something physical. Now, even within my opening, I, I argued that it would be expected for there to be cause and dependent relationships while the soul is embodied, but it doesn't mean that they're the same thing. You cannot you, you cannot point to a cause and effect and then somehow say that therefore that proves identity. In, in philosophy, something is identical to something else. It means it's literally the same thing as. Showing cause and effect okay. or dependence doesn't Toilet mean it's literally the, the same thing. All right, that's Toilet time. I'm right sorry? Or the flux is true or false. That, that's time right there. All right, so now, Eric, you have 10 minutes to cross the MR. Um, how do you know the brain thinks? Again, since I'm not a neurologist myself, I have to trust what the experts say. Every every indication is that if you if you become uh, if, you, if you get drunk or inebriated on some drug, then you are you have enhanced your your ability or altered, impaired your ability to make decisions and so forth. There, when you go without sleep, you lack the ability to concentrate. There are a number of chemicals that will cause you to be unable to concentrate. There's a number of physical conditions. Heat exhaustion, for example, can cause people to lose the ability to focus. These are all indications that the brain is connected to physical reality and has physical external components that impose upon it to impair its ability to think, whereas a, a soul so, would be independent of that. So, so you think because there's cause and effect relationships, it shows that consciousness is in the brain, your thoughts are in the brain, that your brain thinks? We do have indications that consciousness is in the brain as well as the rest of the body, as I said, not just in so the was brain. that a yes? Do I have, believe we have physical aspects can, uh, that, that are affecting? No, yes, there that, are physical effects on the brain's ability and you to believe, think or the body. Do you believe that yeah. that shows that consciousness is physical or in the brain? Yes. Okay, so yes. if – so by popping guitar physical strings effects. and messing up piano, piano keys, that shows a note C – that shows, yeah, that shows the note C is inside the piano. If I open that bad boy up, I can pull the note C out. Okay. I, I, it was a serious question. But by your line of logic, by your yeah, line I, of I logic, just, you should say yes. Yeah, it, it's, in it's, other it's, words, if you think that cause and effect shows that something's in the other, then showing a cause and effect relationship with a, with an instrument, you would have to, if you're going to be consistent logically, you're going to have to say the note C, yes, is in the guitar. Why? Because I, as I asked you the question, I don't what know how you're not tracking C? here. As yeah. I'm sorry? What is a note C? Well, it's, it's my turn to ask questions, but it's a, it's a, a certain sound. Uh, it's a, it's a, something that you experience in the mind. Just and the response. You're not describing what it is. No, see, it's a certain pitch. It's not something physical, I'd even say, because I can I can have that in my mind sound without it being played in, in the, air. The, the The sound vibration. Uh, that's one way it's exhibited. It's one, yeah, can, that, that, can you hear a song in your Can you hear a song in your mind? Yeah. And what vibrations are going on there? <laughs> Uh, I'm doing a different kind of a data relay. It's much like when you play something on your computer. It's obviously not twanging any any chords there. Okay, so then it's not necessarily just a vibration in the air. Thank you. Okay, so your line of logic was that showing 
Your your line of logic was showing that a cause and effect relationship somehow proved that that was inside, that, that the consciousness was in the brain. And yet you're not going to accept that when it comes to the note C or guitar or piano. Or take a CD. You don't think the music is inside the CD, do you? Of course I do. It's data. The music is inside the CD. It's inside. But it. the note C, it depends on what we're, what we're defining. The note C is not in the guitar. The note C is the vibration of the string that reacts through the air. Now, it can be interpreted other ways by other devices and repeated in other ways by other devices. Okay, so then how is that so hard to understand the concept that you can have a soul that's embodied, and yet if you mess with the brain, you're going to affect the way the soul uh, interacts? What, because we get back to the same point was what is the value or, or indication that there is a soul in the first place? So the, the brain has all these, That's, we know the physical, physical effects <coughs> happen to the brain, right? Okay. We, we've got to establish all that. Where's the soul? That's a, a question of a physical thing. It's like saying, where's the number two? Okay. What, what would be the, what would, what would should we expect if somebody has a soul or we don't have a soul? How can we, uh, what what would be the expected conditions from brain damage or what have you? We should expect uh, cause and effect relationships, just like if I mess a guitar up or scratch a CD, it's going to affect the way the thing operates. Whether there is a soul or not a soul, it's exactly the same circumstances either way. That's a great question. So even though it's my turn to ask questions, but I, I don't mind the more open dialogue. So I'm fine with that. I think it makes for better conversation. <clears throat> so uh, you can have, so there's something called P zombies. It's another philosophical concept that you can have interactions just like we're having. And yet you are conscious because you can, you can have, so for example, well, let me, let me ask you this way. Do you think a computer is conscious? Not yet. No. Why not? Well, one, as I, as I described, consciousness is a perception of self and an awareness of surroundings. And computers and don't have... And how do you know that's not? Because computers do you know? don't have... Be, just keep asking the question. I, I can try to answer it. No, I'm, there, there might have been a lie. Go ahead. Okay. I think there might have been. Computers don't have any, besides receiving power and data input from the internet, they don't have any information about their surroundings. My computer has no way of knowing what kind of a, a desk or room or, or surroundings it's in. There's no possible perception there, not even chemical. Can't, but could so you not, well, I would, I, would, I would still be curious how you know that, but could I program a computer that when it has it can exhibit certain kinds of outputs like uh, perceived danger, if you will. Yes. Oh, so then according to what you said earlier, then a computer would be in pain, which would be a conscious state. If you equip it with pain receptors and get it to have capacity to understand that. My computer doesn't have any of that. My computer has no so consciousness. Pain. It is possible. <clears throat> what the reason that I said not yet is that I'm saying that it is, that it is potential that a computer could have consciousness. When would you know? Would how, you do you know, know? how do you know someone else is conscious? How do I know if someone else is conscious? Are we, are we going to drop right into questioning the whole of reality and assuming that, that, that if there are no mind independent reality and I'm the, just, everybody's a figment no. of my imagination. Okay. I just no, want to make sure to we don't assuming that. No, I'm you not assuming. assuming every time someone no, asks question. those kind of questions that's that that's, question. Not an assumption. Okay. So how do I know someone else is conscious? Mm -hmm. Do they exhibit signs of consciousness? I try not to look at everything. Behavior, right? I try not to look at everything in terms of absolutes. Consciousness itself is an emergent aspect. There are degrees of it, many of them. And it's not like uh, what Chalmers, I think it was, who came up with the false dichotomy that, that consciousness is something that you don't have until you have so many neurons. And then when you cross that certain threshold, you suddenly have consciousness, like it's a light switch. We know that it's not that way. So that's that's my problem with the hard problem is we know that consciousness doesn't work that way, that there are degrees of it. And it's not like a, a sudden on and off thing. You either have it or you don't. Right. No, I would agree with that. And, and that's why I wouldn't, I don't know how you can possibly say that consciousness emerges from something physical. Like that. that's, that's 
well, we did just describe this. If you have a computer that has sensory apparatus, I mean, you have a, a, like a Roomba, for example, has some perception of its outside, uh, outside environment, but it doesn't have the capacity to understand its own role in it. Now, you can program that in, right? It, it, it knows that it's, it needs to steer or whatever, but it doesn't really understand that. There are ways for it to understand that. There are ways that you know, even cockroaches and such, with the very simple systems that they have, when you flip on the kitchen light, they understand they're, that they're exposed and they have to run for their lives. There are, there are programs that could be put into a system, and I hope they don't ever do this. I know they will, but I would rather that they not, wherein computers can have this degree of consciousness, where they're going to be aware of where they are and of themselves in that environment. So we can agree we don't and want Skynet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of the things that it hugely frustrates me. I know how curious people are, and they want to know what they can do, but we are not that smart. We were so we we're, were so stupid a species that we dared call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens, the height of arrogance. And then we're going to turn around and build something that is smarter than we are by orders of magnitude, but doesn't have any of our humanity. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and I'm enjoying the discussion, by the way. So, uh, Roomba is in some sense aware of its surroundings, and you said earlier that would be uh, uh, qualities of consciousness, but then I don't think you think a Roomba is conscious, do you? Again, there's a degrees. I wouldn't have thought that a paramecium was conscious until it was able to detect that it's being engulfed and has to flee. Now, there's no what? Well, well, there are some basic systems that are built into a Roomba. I mean, it does detect when it's been trapped or whatever and calls for help. I mean, that does happen. But does it know where it is? Does a paramecium know where it is? Does a, does a slime mold know where it is? It's not a yes or no question. There's a degree to which it does, and it may be very small. Did we lose Eric again? I think we did lose Eric again. Let me okay. see. Uh, I think his Wi-Fi might have dipped out again. <clears throat> Let me see if I get them back real quick. Yeah. Are we ready for audience questions? Uh, there's a 10 minute cross examination for you. And then we'll go to the closing and then audience. Okay. Let me see if he, oh, there he goes. Okay. He's back now. Yep. He's back. I don't know what keep my internet a second time. It's gone out. Yeah, that was the end of your 10 minutes right there. So Aaron, you have 10 minutes to cross examine Eric. Yeah, I think I've already done mine, really. Okay. I'll, I'll take a quick load of my my looks at or my notes, and uh, I, I just have the same questions still, so I'm just going to leave it. All right, sounds good. Sounds good. All right, so we're going to transition to closing statements. Uh, Eric, you're up for closing, man. How long is closing? Is it five minutes? Uh, ten minutes, or if you if you conclude in five minutes, that's fine. But the max ten minutes. Yeah, no, I, I won't need too long. So uh, just to kind of reiterate what we've done so far, um, I said that this is not a scientific question. It's a question of metaphysics. Uh, quoted philosopher of science, Michael Roos, even himself says that there are certain questions science can't ask, much less answer. Um, <clears throat> because to try and uh, ask for scientific or empirical evidence for a soul would be like uh, uh, trying to uh, look for an invisible man. If I say an invisible man exists and someone says, well, no, he doesn't because I looked for him and I didn't see him, it's to fail to understand the nature of what's being said. That doesn't prove there is an invisible man, but it does show that in order to disprove there is no invisible man, you cannot appeal to the sense of sight. So um, I, I think already it, it started off uh, as a category fallacy from Arn's part. Um, <clears throat> now I did uh, the, the just, I guess, to even reiterate some of the points I made was if Consciousness is physical. According to Leibniz's law of the indiscernibility of identicals, every conscious mental state and property is going to have to be identical and share some physical state and property with the physical. But I demonstrated and showed through a number of ways that it has, and I would just invite the listeners to go back and, and listen to my opening. Um, then you have a, a, a using the same concept of Leibniz's law of identity, that I am more than my brain and body. If I'm nothing more than a brain and body, we can put it this way. If I'm just a brain and body, then personhood is a degreed property, and people with more mass and matter are more persons 
uh, uh, than people who are not. And as I said, men are typically larger than women. And yet we wouldn't say that men have more value or more pers persons than women. That's because uh, being a person is not something that can be granted in something physical. You also have identity through change. Physical objects, aggregates, which is a metaphysical technical term do not maintain identity through change or part replacement i do uh, i am the same person from one moment to the next even if i lose and gain new memories or parts or if i become god forbid a paraplegic i am still 100 percent a person i'm still eric hernandez which shows us that my identity and existence as a human person is not dependent on nor grounded in something physical like my brain and body um then we talked about free will, uh, which Aaron seemed to say that he didn't believe in, and then at one point said that he freely came to believe that he did not have free will, but then also said in another instance, if I'm not mistaken, that he doesn't believe we have free will. Uh, basically, if, if there is no soul, there can be no free will because you're just a purely physical object which is going to react to external factors based on the laws of chemistry and physics, and every action, thought, and belief is going to be causally determined by external factors beyond your control, including the belief there is no soul and there is no God, and if that's the case, why should you believe what you're determined to believe? I don't um, shake a magic eight ball on it when it says, yes, I believe it, because it's not something designed to obtain truth, and it's not something with free will, it's something that it's just determined to say. Um, there's no reason for me to, to believe it, and if all all your beliefs, actions, and thoughts are causally determined, you have no reason and you're not justified in believing anything that you do believe uh, because you're just a byproduct of chemistry and physics that is causally determined. Uh, however, I think he freely came to be just in the soul of intellectual reasons, and I think rightly really who do harm and evil. And he wants to hold them morally accountable. But if you're just a physical brain and body, that's something that can't be done. Um, so if you are the same person from one to the next, if you have free will, if you if you have intellectual responsibility, moral responsibility, uh, and if all the properties of the brain uh, and the properties of the mind are not shared, then it follows that you cannot be merely something physical. You must be something more than that, namely a soul. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Closing the statement. All right, Arn, you're up for your closing remarks. Yeah, Eric makes so many unwarranted assumptions. For example, the definition of personhood is, is by definition of being not weight me measured in a gradient by height or weight. And he said that this doesn't apply to him, but it does because it's a matter of history. I mean, why not, when I describe why did we come to believe that we have a soul or spirit, this really is, I think, the reason. I'm going to get into it. We feel the breeze against our bodies all the time. Early tribes of primitive, primitive people couldn't explain the changes in the clouds or the weather that they brought, but they knew that the wind could move things, even carry things off into the sky as if held aloft by invisible hands. And uh, no one knew what smoke was. They thought that dust devils were literally devils and that that's where the legends of genies came from. Whirlwinds appear out of nowhere and throw your stuff around and then disappear in evanescence. That's how we still. That's why we still imagine spirits. How we still imagine spirits today, at least the devilish ones. No one understood diseases either, but they figured out pretty quickly that rancid fumes or the breath of a sick person could make others sick too. That's why they say "bless you" when you sneeze, because sneezing and coughing are how you spread disease. They thought that when you sneeze, the good spirit leaves your body, and an evil spirit might jump in to take your place. That's why they say "bless you." If you're sneezing or coughing, you're spreading evil spirits that might kill you or someone else. And notice that in the Bible, God performs a golem spell where he fashions a man out of mud and breathes into it the breath of life to animate it, to make it come alive. Wherein Adam did not acquire a soul, instead he became a, a living soul. And there are other versions of this trope in even older myths from Mesopotamia through the Orient, where some sort of magician makes clay figures come alive by breathing the breath of life into them. There are also other references to the breath of life, where the movement of air is akin to a spiritual essence. A traditional Jewish belief is that when newborns take their first breath, they are infused with the spirit and become a living being. So air equals spirit. Since no one yet understood that air was made of particulate matter, but everyone knew that you would die if you can't breathe, and they knew that when people or animals die, they stop breathing, then it was believed that the movement of air was somehow spiritual and that this spirit went inside you to give you life in genesis 1 2 when it says that only the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters it's obviously talking about the wind for another example in ezekiel 37 5 10 or 5 through 10 uh, there's a necromancer going into a boneyard to revive a, an army of the dead 
And thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in in you, and ye shall live, and ye will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied that I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, and then I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them all above, and there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, to say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come ye four winds, O breathe and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. I should point out that the, the four winds, or animoi, animate, uh, were Greek gods, different than Yahweh, the, or Yehovah, the, Jehovah, the uh, volcano god, and it's surprising that he would tell one of his prophets to pray to Animoi. But of course, then in the uh, Genesis 6, we have the flood, which was meant to drown everything that had the breath of life. And then Ecclesiastes 3, 18 to 21, gives another example of how our notions of spirituality actually stem from a misunderstanding of the natural aspects of air. I said to myself, concerning the sons of men, that God has surely tested them in order to see, in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so does the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast. For all is vanity. All go to the same place. All come from the dust and return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and that the breath of the beast descends downward into the earth? And notice here again, that if we had a soul, then animals have one too, but we don't. It's just our breath. All the rest is vanity. And thus, according to the, the uh, this is according to the New American Standard Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, the American Version, and the King James Version, all replace the word breath with spirit. And likewise, if you compare Luke 23, 46 in the New American Standard or the New Revised Standard Versions of the Bible with the King James or American Standard Version, you'll see again that breathed his last means the same thing as gave up the ghost. When the story that, that Jesus commits him, his spirit to God or gives up the ghost, he breathes his last. In each case, they're, they're making clear that breath of life is spirit. The translation, this translation eloquently illustrates the gaseous origins of man's belief in his own soul. All of that is literally nothing more than hot air. All right. Thank you guys for the closing remarks. So now, so we're going to transition to the Q&A. Um, we do have some questions here for you. First question coming at you, Eric. This is for you, man. You'll see it pop up at the bottom of the screen. All right, question for Eric. Can we know the soul exists because of the veracity of the Bible? Um, well, I, I think the Bible is in support of it, obviously, as a Christian, of course. Um, uh, in fact, given some of the things that Aaron mentioned, uh, would at least show a distinction between the body and the soul. Um, I don't want to get into the, the Greek and Hebrew, uh, but nevertheless, that would show that there is a distinction. So, yeah, the Bible would affirm that there is a soul, especially when you get into some other things that I would rather not get into and open up another kind of worms. But, you know, we can point to things like, well, let's say this, if if uh, Christ uh, resurrected and he was alive in the intermediate state, uh, you have other instances of people being alive after death. Uh, you have even Christ talking to the Sadducees and saying that God is a God of the living and he's a God of X, Y, and Z, and these people are dead, yet if he's a God of the living, these people must still be alive. Um, so yeah, definitely the Bible is in support of, of a substance dualist type position. All right. Uh, Aaron, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I have to disagree that obviously the Bible doesn't support this, and it was written by different people at different times who very clearly had different ideas in the different passages that they wrote. So, I mean, yeah, some of them had a different idea. Some of them had an idea that, that you go to something like like the Greek version of Hades, which was originally the, the Hebrew version of, what was it, uh, Sheol, or prior, prior to that, it was like under Ereshkigal. Er Right, so yeah, they had this concept once upon a time, and then and then you get this other notion that appears to be in, influenced by Zoroastrianism, where you have the judgment where the good people will rise to be uh, in the kingdom of justice and truth under Hura Mazda, and the wicked men will descend into the kingdom of the lie ruled by Araman the Opposer, which is the origin of the Christian concept of Satan. But just because the Bible is written by a bunch of different people with a bunch of different conflicting opinions, 
doesn't imply that we actually have this thing that we have no reason to believe that there ever was. You said conflicting opinions. What is that? What, what opinions do? What examples can you give as opinions that are conflicting? The ones I just gave. Okay, so if you have the if you have this notion that like Ecclesiastes just said, you know, who knows whether the breath rises to heaven or or the breath of the animal goes down into the earth, right? Well, that's that's obviously a completely different concept than the notion. Well, it, it's it's related to the notion of going into Sheol or uh, Hades under Ereshkigal. Uh, or no, no, Hades, it was, um, I forget what the name is in the Mesopotamian lore, but I mean, it was a place where all the dead went, and they were just dead. So you, 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 don't, you don't go somewhere necessarily. Your breath is there, but you don't necessarily go there. And then later you have this other belief that you somehow remain alive after you're dead, and, it, and it's somehow still you both in heaven and in hell, this new concept where you're being tortured all the time, which is a very different concept than the original suggestion. So yeah, they're, they're very different ideas and they conflict with each other. Eric, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think he's, he's, he's stretching a lot of instances. I think it's, it's clear, I mean, if we're made in the image of God and God is a non-physical unembodied mind, then I think there's some, in some sense from the beginning you have that uh, we're more than just something physical. Even he quoted earlier about God putting his breath into Adam, which would show, and Adam didn't come become a living being until that, so there was something more than just something purely physical. I think that's there from the beginning. I think it's all throughout scripture. He mentions in Ecclesiastics, which interestingly, uh, uh, which is believed to be written by Solomon. Solomon takes a naturalist perspective and begins uh, this uh, existential, almost pessimistic outlook on life and begins to ask these kind of questions. For example, he says the sea is not full, which is to say, I mean, there is no purpose or teleology to life. The sea is never full because it wasn't meant to be full or empty. It just is, and everything is vanity under the sun. So he's taking a naturalistic, pessimistic type of outlook, uh, which is interestingly a, a really uh, – nice uh, uh, twist and, and apologetic that he has going on there showing that if there is no God and everything is just matter then here's what we get and it's something that leads to just nothing but vanity I don't understand why naturalistic it, it associates with pessimistic to you because Ecclesiastes 3 the part I, that I just read I mean that's the only wisdom I found in the entire book I didn't say I was associated with it I'm saying he's taking that outlook yeah why why, why would it be pessimistic or why do you perceive it as pessimistic? So the way he describes things, like it says, everything is vanity, vanity of vanities. Uh, he talks about his life in a pessimistic way, uh, saying that the sea is not full. If there is only earth, wind, fire, and water, the basic elements, and there's really no, there's no teleology, a, a sake for which something happens. Everything just happens, and there's no purpose, rhyme, or reason to it. Why would that be pessimistic? I don't well, see honesty <laughs> you, you, pessimistic. I don't. I don't see realism as being pessimistic. So, really, <laughs> well, that would beg the question that that that's real. But I mean, well, obviously, you know the Christian perspective, and and I I think you know why that would be a pessimistic outlook. That there is nothing for the sake of an end. There's no teleology to life. Uh, if well, a heart stops beating, I can't say that I know the Christian perspective. I mean, because Marlon just here uh, introduced one person in, in an upcoming debate. One person's a Mormon, and the other one's a Christian. Doesn't that mean they're both Christians? I was raised by a Mormon family, they damn sure think they're Christian. Every one of them. It's the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. So I've heard a lot of different Christians saying that other Christians aren't true Christians, that the Catholics are just merry worshiping pagans, and the Jehovah's Witnesses don't count either. And so they're very good at excluding each other and saying they have a completely different set of beliefs, and they're not even all Trinitarians. There's Unitarians and Binitarians in there too, because I was raised by some of them. So there is no the Christian perspective. There's lots of different ones. And they they vehemently contradict each other. I mean, don't well, you that's think there's a reason Jesus why? They, for and stuff. Don't, don't you think there's a reason why they contradict each other? Sort of veering off topic a little bit of the whole debate, but don't you? I, I think that's the main reason why we differentiate between Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and all those groups will say that they're Christian, but there are theological differences that say, uh, "No, you're not Christian." Don't you think that's the case, and why we make such why would a drastic it, why, difference? Okay, so. Uh, they, they both start from a Christian perspective. They both worship Jesus. They, I mean, they, they meet every criteria for being Christian, except that one group says the other one isn't. Uh, no, well, that, that Mormons actually, actually, Mormons the, the Mormons actually, uh, Mormons definitely think they're Christian. Yeah, they can think all they want, but Mormons are actually yeah, polytheistic in their theology, and Christians are the monotheistic. So Christian. that's a drastic difference right there. The Catholics think they're Christian. Yeah. Are they Christian? 
Who decides whether Catholics are Christian? <laughs> who decides whether Catholics are Christian? And how there's do you a, decide? There, there's a, so, so, well, there's a difference between a Catholic and a Mormon. There's a lot of differences. So even And you look at Scripture, and, and I, I don't want to get into a theological debate and into what, what the Bible teaches, but even Paul himself talking against the Gnostics, saying if, if someone comes preaching a different gospel and says that Christ didn't rise from the dead bodily, then we should reject them and that you shouldn't believe anything that anyone else preaches to you, including an angel, which is something that, of course, Joseph Smith believed happened to him that was really contrary to Scripture. So there's definitely criteria for it, and, I mean, that's a, a topic for a no, entirely different debate. That Paul thought there were angels, angels who go around lying to people. I mean, you can't trust them. Yeah, they're called demons. The <laughs> well, yeah, they're called demons. So what? 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 What decides whether a Catholic is Christian? Are Catholics Christians? How would you know? So, like I said, I, I don't want it, to. It's going to be way off topic. It can be. It, a, it, 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 There's no it, such thing as the christian perspective because i've heard lots of them and they contradict each other and they exclude each other I mean, pretty it is quite oh, it, it, it is quite off topic so let's turn a line on what we're talking okay. about here so the question is does the soul exist so and what evidence can you support Arn, that says the soul does not exist does not exist. what i presented what i presented right, you, was your, what would you say is your I, strongest what would you say is your strongest argument that says the soul does not exist? Well, the strongest argument that people make for this, the 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 the, the, the evidence they most like to uh, to present is out of body experiences, which when you see the way that they're presented, even in peer reviewed scientific papers, as as I've demonstrated, there's there are peer reviewed papers, and I cited one of them today, that that list these uh, these experiences to prove that they are real, in an attempt to prove that people are actually leaving their body and that they're able to, to, to see things in the operating theater and know things that there's no possible way that they could know, that they, they can only see this from a perspective or whatever. But the, the guy's buying into an awful lot. He's making a lot of assumptions. He's trying to pull on a belief system, even though it's a peer-reviewed paper. But as I said, there are other papers that show contradicting statements. And then there's the, the God helmet that duplicates all of these effects. So the, the people who have claimed to have been out of body and make their career on the fact that they study near-death experiences and they study out-of-body experiences and they had out-of-body experiences and then they put on the God helmet and that's more impressive than what they've already – really? It's an artificial simulator and they know it's an artificial, and simula an, an artificial simulator. So, I mean, Susan Blackmore was saying what it, she actually made the statement that what if you had this experience and it was caused by some other thing? What if it was caused by a, a neurolog neurological trauma? You didn't have the helmet that you know is going to cause this. Wouldn't you believe this is absolutely real? And she used that to, to, to criticize the people who believed that they were abducted by aliens saying how you could have this experience and well, that would really convince you even when it didn't happen and she's talking about them but the very subject she was on a moment ago was on out-of-body experiences and the logical thing she should have connected was if you'd had this without this god helmet you would think that 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 your out-of-body experience was real why didn't she make the leap the connection to realize that it's amazing i don't i have no idea but that's the that's the argument that people bring up most often, and that's the reason that I got into transcendental meditation myself because I wanted firsthand information on this, and unfortunately, it turned out there isn't any. Well, Eric, Eric was any of your argument centered around centered around near death experiences, the scientific journal, if you will, or, or scientific study of of the near death experiences? Was any of your argument centered around that, or was yours more uh, more centered around uh, the, the consciousness of the mind, philosophic the philosophy of the mind? What, what would you say about that, Eric? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's interesting he brought that up. I don't know why he did, because uh, um, none of my arguments revolved around that. Um, now, I have, well, I'll say, I'll say that for afterwards, but, uh, yeah, so my arguments revolved around the nature and existence of consciousness, its its properties and states, how they're not identical to anything physical, and the nature of being a, a, a personhood and what it means uh, and what that entails and what that would entail that we were just purely physical objects. Now, what I was going to say is I have nothing against uh, NDEs. In fact, I think they actually do happen. One of the reasons I didn't bring it up is because I think oftentimes, depending on who you're talking to, if you're talking to someone who hasn't studied the field, it, it gets it, it even takes more unpacking to do. 
So I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't bring that up. But no, I, I think there's a lot of, of, of verified NDEs, and there are some that are even published by, uh, if I'm not mistaken, scientific journals and, and reputable uh, people and places that have been verified by doctors. And there's a lot of, lot of interesting cases where people know things they could not have known, uh, where, uh, um, I mean, I, I can go through a lot, but it, it's something I haven't studied to the satisfaction of being willing to present and defend it. Uh, I do plan on doing that in the future, but uh, Moreland and Gary Habermas have written a lot about that, and there are a lot of, lot of interesting cases. I've talked to people personally who've had these types of experiences, but again, knowing things that they could not have known anything from like – my father just died, and when they get resuscitated, they're freaking out, saying, please call my dad, please call my dad. I just talked to him, and he's dead. And everybody's saying, no, I just talked to him this morning. He's fine. They, they, they end up getting him on the phone. Turns out, yes, he is dead. Uh, it did. He did die in the way that it was just described. Uh, someone who underwent a very rare type of procedure that I think at that point only one other person had had that type of procedure done to them. When they went under and they came back to, they described exactly what the procedure, what it looked like, how it happened. This is something you can't get from just watching a movie because, again, this had only been done one other time. There's only two people in the entire world who are even certified to do this type of procedure. So I think there's a lot of evidence uh, uh, for NDEs, but like you said, it's not something I brought up or presented in my argument because I don't think you necessarily need those, but I think they definitely do add to the credibility of the cumulative case. All right. So I, I just said how these can be duplicated, and 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 we have anecdotal uh, experiments that are you know unrepeatable and so yeah. forth. And then we also have confirmation so, bias because so we, I've seen people in my life that that say that that they're terribly nervous about something, they suspect something's going on, they pinpointed who the person is that they're, they're worried about, whatever. And if it turned out that something had happened to that person, of course, then I would be hearing for the rest of my life about how that person was psychic and guessed correctly, but it turns out that person was fine. And then, of course, they dismiss that they were so worried and concerned about something that turned out not to even be a thing. They need to acknowledge the failures just you know right along with the successes. You can't just call out the success. Right, and and the the article in the book I talked about that's being published, and I can I can send you the list. I know uh, Moreland has them listed in the uh, in uh, some uh, one of the recent second edition of the Philosophical Foundations for Christian Worldview. Um, but yeah, you know you're right. So they 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 look at all of these pieces of evidence, and um, when you're looking at some of these things that again are verified, signed off by doctors, and you have uh, these, and, and you keep saying you know you, they can redo it with this God helmet or something like that. I, I could put a helmet on you, Arn, and have you experience uh, you being at the beach. It doesn't mean beaches don't exist. So just because you you can replicate an experience doesn't invalidate the fact that the person had a vertical experience in the first place. Do it's you admit that the helmet is physical? Yes, you can do physical things to the brain just okay, like so I can do physical things to a guitar. So it's doing a physical thing to the brain. And these people sure. get the, it's not affecting the soul, the, the soul, right? I mean, the God helmet isn't doing squat to their soul. It's affecting the brain. So when they perceive, He's, as predicted, you would, that there, there are other people in the room or that they're having an out-of-body experience or that they're in the presence of a god or a demon or whatever, these are entirely physical and they're producing physical responses, which in, in the term of faults, or, or excuse me, thoughts, which you say are not physical, yet we have proof that they are. No, we don't. We don't have any proof that a thought is physical. We, they share different properties. Showing how do we have a physical device making physical effects in a physical brain to produce these thoughts if the thoughts are not physical and are independent of physicality, if it's actually just, in the soul? What is, what is the God helmet, the physical God helmet, doing to the soul? To cause the soul to hallucinate something. It's, it's affecting the instrument the soul I don't know how you still don't get this. It's affecting the instrument the soul uses. If I scratch a CD, I'm not scratching the music. I'm scratching the physical instrument. So is it's it, not, it's not what, that hard. What, so when the body perceives, the brain perceives, do you expect that the brain perceives this other being that isn't really there? So the brain is being stimulated no. to perceive something, and you're saying that it's not the soul that perceives it, or is it? When the, when the God helmet works and it causes somebody to perceive, to imagine themselves in an out of body situation, is the brain thinking that or is the soul thinking that? Yeah, so it's my soul that thinks. It's my soul that sees. It's not my brain or eyeballs, but those are Your instruments soul my soul uses. By this physical device running yes. electrical impulses, physical electrical impulses yes. into a physical brain, and it's causing it's causing your soul to be deceived by that, not your brain. 
No, there's no. Okay, so th th this gets into even the incorrigibility of of uh, your mental states, phenomenological conscious. Uh, the soul is not being deceived; it's actually experiencing. Your mind is actually experiencing something. If I walk into a room and I see a red ball. I am actually experiencing a sensation of redness, and if I turn on the light and see that it was actually orange, although I was incorrect about the physical object, I was not incorrect about my mental states because your mental states are incorrigible while you – while uh, uh, physical objects in the external world you can be wrong about, which again would show that they're not identical. I can um, – I cannot be wrong about my mental so, states, but I can be wrong about the object of my mental state. So we're not we're not fooling the the soul. It's just the soul thinks that there's a, a god or a demon or an out of body experience that isn't there, but we haven't fooled the soul. It thinks something that isn't true because of a physical device that can't affect a physical being. The soul is not a physical being yet. It's being affected by a physical device. Do you how so, do you so not you're not, see you're, all not these you're not you're not tracking with what I'm saying. If I if I am dreaming and let's say I'm in class and I'm dreaming that I'm falling and I wake up and I see that I'm not falling, did I have an experience of falling? Yes. So in that sense, I did have the experience. Was it something that actually happened in the external world? No. So if by falling you mean was it actually something that happened? No. Was it actually something they were experiencing? Yes, and that's the difference. So we have a device, a physical device that that stimulates the brain, a physical organ to change thoughts, but you say thoughts don't exist in the brain. You say that every neurologist in the world is wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't. They study the brain and how it thinks. You say the brain doesn't think. Every neurologist. I mentioned. That's pulling. I, I mentioned. Pushing the button. I mentioned. I mentioned two neurologists in the beginning. I could have mentioned more that believe in the soul. Stop saying that all neurologists uh, are, are physicalists. Yes, that is simply demonstrably thing. false. All right. That is demonstrably false. All right, guys. We're gonna the, go to the, the next neurologist. question real quick. We'll go to the next question. All right, this is coming right. at you. This is for you, Arn. I believe this is for Arn. With, uh, let's read. With no mind or soul, it believe, if beliefs are to further naturalistic evolution of the species and could be equally true or false, how can Arn assume his cognitive faculties produce reliable, reliably true beliefs? Because I test them objectively. But are, are your beliefs about your test not something you are equally determined to do and believe? I'm sorry, what? So you say you can trust your beliefs because you can test them, even if you're determined. But are, are, your, are not your beliefs about... There, there's got to be a lag. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. No, no. You're, uh, well, I, go ahead. I, I didn't hear what you said. I don't trust things in a, in, a, in a binary way. It's not that I trust this completely or, or completely distrust this, right? So objective being the difference between objective and subjective is subjective is entirely up to my own impressions or opinions or whatever. But I'm testing these against my own experience or against my own interests in many cases and with other people and with other data. So it doesn't come down to anybody's opinion. It's what the data says. So can I test it? Can it? But one of the things that science does is try to prove the perspective wrong. What fact would stand against this being true, and then test for that? Yeah. So, so my point was, if you have no free will and all your beliefs and actions are determined, then your very beliefs and actions to test your beliefs and your beliefs about your results of your test are equally something you were determined to do and believe, and you're back to the same problem. But we're not because we're not. All my all my decisions are not determined before I have that data. Now, while there are indications and tendencies, and I will lean because of, because of these indications and past experiences and everything, I can still make a decision based on information. It's not determined that I'm going to accept or reject this information before I even know what it is. You don't, you don't believe in the law of cause or closure? Pass. Can you just roll your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> but if the law of God's closure is true, and if your beliefs are something physical, then that physical thing was caused by something prior and physical, and it's going to eventually be something prior and physical yes, external and to that yourself. Doesn't, you destroy and that does not mean <laughs> does not mean that my decision is determined before I have the data on which to make the decision. We know what my tendencies are going to be. We know, you know, my proclivities are 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 already estimated. We could guess in advance what decision I'm going to make. But I still make that decision after I have the information. It's not determined. I don't think you understand what determinism is, but okay. Uh, I wasn't talking about determinism. 
Next question, here it comes. It's sort of on the same subject a little bit. So for the audience says, what do you think C.S. Lewis arguments against naturalism? A strict materialism refutes itself for the reason given long ago by Professor Howden. If my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. And hence, I Why? have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. Why? I've, I've heard this so many times. I just don't understand. Where, what is the logical failure that causes a question like that? Why, why do people ask this question? Because it makes no damn sense. Okay, so we have, we have a physical brain. We have a physical body. That means I shouldn't trust it? Why? You have a physical brain and a physical body in most cases, regardless what you believe. Whether, whether you have this mystical aspect added to it or not. And yet... Not only do you trust it, but you trust it on things that are not evidently true. And you still believe things that are evidently not true, and you believe them anyway. So, and why are you talking about me about what I trust? Why do you trust any of the things that you believe? That would make sense. Yeah, so the person who asked that was J.B.S. Halding, who was a scientist and an atheist. So you'd have okay. to ask him why he's asking that. And I think and I think his point is, is relevant. If, again, if your thoughts and beliefs are causally determined by non-rational factors, then the conclusion and your beliefs are going to also be causally determined and non-rational. When, where was non-rational in here? Did I miss that completely? Well, you probably missed the implications. Yeah, I, yeah, well, yeah, I don't see an implication that any of it is non-rational. I mean, <sighs> rational means that I'm open to reason, right? And, and that, I, that I can be reasoned with. And that I'm going to be basing my my opinions on evidence and so forth, right? Where is there what, where is a lack this. of rationality? Let me ask you this. Suppose I was able I was a mad scientist and I was able to control every thought, belief, and action you had. And I can I can mm -hmm. make you do, think, and we'll act however I wanted to. We've always got to come no, back to the matrix. No, 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 no. We're not the no matrix. We're we're here, we're live. Let's suppose there was technology that you I can control every, every thought, effect. action. No, if reality is even real, but we're not having the argument no. about whether reality. Is real. Let let me finish. Let me finish a thought experiment, and then you can yep. tell me what you think. Suppose okay. I can control every thought, belief, and action that you had. Mm -hmm. Would you have reason to believe if you knew that? Would you have reason to just uh, to believe what you were thinking if you knew that it was me causing you to believe something? Did you cause me to think it? Did you cause me to yep. question whether I – did you cause me to question – did you cause me to know that you're the one that's controlling my thoughts? Yep, well, if I know yes. that you're controlling my thoughts, then I know that you're controlling my thoughts. Right, and would that undercut your your uh, your trust or reliability in what you think or believe if you knew that I was the one controlling that? If somebody else is controlling my thoughts and I can't even try to – I can't even wrap my head around – how I could think something knowing that I'm not thinking it, how, how I can think that you're thinking or how, how you are thinking for me, then I should just ask you the question because you're obviously the one doing all the thinking. Okay, let me put it differently. Let's say there's a third person we we're doing this to. Would you trust that this person was being rational if you knew that I was the one controlling all his thoughts, beliefs, and actions? Look up what rational means. Are we fitting with that? I mean, are you making your decisions based on actual information? Are you being reasonable? Are you open to being reasonable? I'm reason making with? them believe that. Let's say I'm making them okay. believe that. I'm making them believe that they're, and, they're, and they're acting know. rational. So you're, you're making them know that everything they believe is an illusion. That they no, don't let's actually say believe I'm not making them, being let's, fed to them. Let's say, I'm, let's say I'm not, I don't give them that part of it. I don't let them know that I'm controlling it. All of their thoughts, okay. beliefs, and actions are controlled by me. You and I know that, but they don't. I make okay. them think that what they're thinking is true. I make them think that what they're doing is rational. Would you agree okay. with me that, that, that what they're doing and thinking is probably not rational because I'm controlling everything? If they, what they think is rational and they're being rational, they're being rational. So, yeah, it may be in the, in the matrix because that's what we did come down to anyway. You will, you will follow what you think is rational. It may be a lie. But you're still going to follow that. If you understand that the way that uh, the way that we smell things is by picking up subtle molecules in the air of different things, and, and we're, we're getting these in the receptors, or if you understand that these little hairs and the stirrups and everything in our ears actually how the way we perceive sound, or the way the cones in our eyes reflect light, you understand that how these senses work. And then somebody tells you that there's no such thing as reality and there's no such thing as matter, 
And then you have to think, well, that means that every expert in the world who understands these senses actually doesn't know anything. Nobody knows anything except the guy who's claiming to know more all the, than all the experts because he's the one that says reality isn't real and it's all this huge, convoluted, ridiculously overcomplicated violation of Hitchens and Occam's razor to create this illusion so that you think that your eyes work this way. Well, none of that would be necessary at all. I don't think you're tracking the thought experiment. All right. Well, we'll transition to the next question. All right. Coming at you guys. Question for Aaron. If you get certain thoughts from your brain, can you override those thoughts and stop them? If so, what do you think is you? What do you think is in you that gives you the ability to override those thoughts? I don't know. I guess I would need an example of a. Th I mean, I've I've overridden lots of thoughts. If I start thinking about something, I'll think better of it. I mean, I, I evaluate the things that I think. You know, I, I with certain thoughts. What I don't know. I'm not certain what thought you're talking about, but I have overridden a lot of things. I've changed my mind about a lot of things. I I analyze things. Not just over here? whether they're true or false, but you know, on on elements of of practicality or morality or, or you know things of that. Yeah. So um, yeah. So there's a lot we we didn't get to talk about for various reasons. Um, I had a debate with Delahanty on this very subject, and and I think we were able to cover a little bit more ground. But one thing I didn't get to bring up was so you look at something like neuroplasticity and more specifically cognitive behavioral therapy, which Jeffrey Schwartz is a leading expert in the world on this, who is a neuroscientist and believes in the soul, um, you see that in order for this to be possible, uh, you have to be able to go against your habitual way of thinking, which are uh, in many times, uh, especially with people who suffer from things like a uh, OCD or anxiety or depression, are induced by, by a chemical imbalance of the brain. In order for you to go against these thoughts and utilize the neuroplasticity via cognitive behavioral therapy, you have to be something more than your brain and body that is not merely causally determined by physical uh, prior physical results or actions, which means you have to be something like an immaterial soul for you to have free will even with regards to thinking because we do know that the brain will and can induce certain uh, thoughts and behaviors we can see this when you wake up from a nightmare and still have this feeling of fear but you can override that because you're not merely a brain and body or something more than that and again i think neuroplasticity especially cognitive behavioral therapy goes to show that we're more than brains and bodies in fact jeffrey schwartz the guy i just mentioned the neuroscientist wrote a book called you are not your brain and his premise of this book which goes to show the cognitive behavioral therapy how it works for ocd and anxiety he's a leading researching scholar in this field his entire premise is that you're more than a brain so what does he think the brain does a lot of what i explained it's an instrument okay so it's an instrument that does what it has correlations while embodied with the soul, just like just like the grooves on a CD. The, the music is not in the CD. I don't break the CD and the music spills out. There are grooves on the CD that if you mess with the grooves, you're going to uh, mess with the way the retrieval so stored, is. is uh, so you stored the, the music in, in, a data, uh, in a digital format in those grooves. Well, no, you didn't really store it. What you did was you, you gave grooves that when put in the right retrieval system will know how to interpret those things. But note there needs to be an interpreter. A CD isn't a, that data, is more than the a data storage? CDs uh, well, are not yeah, we data call it data storage. Sure, we call it data storage. But I, I understood you saying that we put it in there as if we put the music in there. Maybe that's not what you meant. But if that's yeah, what you meant, no, I reject it's that. Literally that because it's turned into a digital format and stored in those grooves. So... Yeah, it's one one way or another. It's recorded in there. So the music. So if you break the CD open, the music spills out. Being a digital. Stop your eyes. <laughs> yeah, because the questions are so stupid. Yeah, obviously when you, when you put it in <laughs> because the position is stupid. The groups, and <laughs> then, when you break it, digital uh, format doesn't fall out. There's not a container to hold the digital format. Right. Right, so right. therefore the position is we stupid. Give up the, the position. Thing, and then you, so we both agree with how it works, and then you ask the stupid question that I obviously didn't think, and that nobody thought, just to make me look stupid, as if I thought the thing I didn't think. I'm not trying to make you look stupid. Uh, if uh, I'm not even when, saying why that's would happening. You, uh, why, would you, uh, why would you say, you know that it's data story. It, you know let me tell you why. 
You know just as well as I do that if we break a CD, it doesn't fall out because there's no container for anything to fall out of. So why would you even say that? Is it just to derail the conversation? Because nobody cares. No. Fall out, but we all know that it's in there. That it's in that because it it's an impl- about- Go ahead. Because it's an implication of that view. You either accept the implications of your view or you change your position. It's that easy. If you think it's a stupid question, it's a, it's a byproduct of your view. I'm sorry. Okay. So it's it's a stupid question because you're asking me why I think that's something I don't think. I'm saying that would be logically implied about what you think. So if you think it's stupid, give up the position. But I don't. And uh, none of us do. We all understand. We all understand that data is on there. We all understand how it's on there. I think this is a great question right here, and it sort of—I think it sort of pinpoints uh, some of the exactly what we've been talking about here. Hella Keller said that in her blind, deaf mutism, before she learned language, she knew there is a God. How did she know this? Obviously, she can't and didn't. Knowledge is demonstrable with measurable accuracy. If you can't and if you can't verify the accuracy of your claims to any degree at all by any means whatsoever, then you cannot actually know what you merely believe. And then, as Helen Helen uh, Keller died an atheist, well, then obviously she didn't know there was a God. Eric, in order to have knowledge, you have to be able to demonstrate. For the reasons that I just said, yes. So can you know things that you can't demonstrate? How would you know that you know them? If there's no well, way I don't to think you have it. to know that you no, I, I don't think you, you have to you know that so. you know things in order to know them. <laughs> but you have to be able to demonstrate it because you you really do because there are lots of times that 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 we've thought we knew something or thought we you know it ended up we remembered it incorrectly. And then when you go to check the data, no, it's it actually says it. I, I'll show you right here where it's, oh, it actually says something slightly different than what I thought. That happens. I forget, there's, a, there's the Mandela effect. I can't, I can't remember what they call it, but where you remember something incorrectly yeah. and then it goes out through the culture, everybody remembers it incorrectly. But that's what it is. So you think you know it and you don't know it. You need to be able to verify it. Yeah, I don't think you need to be able to know something before you can know it. That's a Methodist point of view in epistemology. I'm a particularist, and I think when you go off there, you lead into an infinite regress because in order to know something, you have to show how you know it. But then to show how you know that you know it, you have to show that you know that you know it, and it leads into an infinite regress. And and if you're going to roll your eyes again, that is an implication of your position. If you're going to roll your eyes, then give up the position. It's that simple. Wait, wait, wait I understand. I, I, I'm rolling my eyes because it's not my position. I don't do the infinite regress, as I told you a couple of times before. I don't do anything by dichotomy. I do things by degrees. I don't have to be absolutist about it. So do not, you're still ascribing positions I don't share. That's why I'm rolling my eyes. I don't need to reject a position I already rejected before you suggested it was mine. It's an implication of your position is what I'm saying. And it's not. I would rather, be, I would rather you not assume I, I hold positions I don't hold. Okay. All right. And here's another question. And I'm going to have to bugger out here real quick. So let's let's try to get through these. All right. Yeah, I think this is probably the last question. I don't see any more questions. So this is actually the last question here. Uh, it says, Aaron, why why the care for this topic if you don't think anything of moral intrinsic objective worth exists, since you are ultimately responding through chemical reactions? Because I think that moral intrinsic objective worth exists and and because and i i care about truth as well and that the truth is what the facts are we shouldn't be asserting things as truth like the, the gospel truth if you can't show that it's truth you shouldn't be calling it truth you need to be able to show that it's at least true what are your th- what are your thoughts eric man what are your thoughts man um no, I man, I, I think it's the same point that's been brought up. If, if all your beliefs and actions are causally determined, then you have no reason to trust the reliability or truth of them because you're just causally determined to that. And even if you try to test them, eh, your beliefs about the test are still causally determined. And you're back to the same problem. So you, you, and so are you because you're a Christian and you believe in, in prophecy. And then if I, if the, what, what is that? The Calvinists will, will say the same thing about you that you're saying about me for, the, you know, for, for their little belief system. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying that my positions are not 
determined the way that you're describing, but that I do have reason to value truth. And so I'm not going to say something is truth can, if it's not, I can't even show that it's true. And I'm certainly so not going to. Interesting. Uh, so this is interesting. You're saying that because I believe in a God who is omniscient and foreknows the future, you're saying an implication of that view is I can't have free will. Yet when I bring an implication against your view, you're saying, no, that's not what I believe. You can't say I believe it. And yet you can you can say alleged implications of my view and say that I should believe that. That's a bit inconsistent you, you, and hypocritical, don't you think? You, you didn't. You didn't bring up an implication against my position. You you did contradict your own position, for example. I forgot to bring this up earlier when you mentioned that, that God is completely spiritual, yet – He's described in the early works as, as, you know, he walks, talks, eats, drinks, sits, uh, turns his head, shows his backside, waves his hand, and cheats at wrestling, right? I mean, everybody tells me that, that you know, God is just a, a spiritual being. There's no body to him. Yet, three guys show up at Abraham's door. He recognizes one of them as being God. The other two go on down to Sodom, and they become the angels who, who have to d avoid a rape mob. And God, the one that was recognized as God, of the three original ones, two... two Three minus one, or two, there's, that leaves one, and that one sits with him, and Abraham draws nigh to him. We just, these are difficult to, things to do, to sit under a tree in the shade and eat with a God who is just a spirit. So, these again, these are, they're contradictions, is because the people that wrote these things had different ideas. And so you just have to gloss over where it says that God definitely had a body and was eating and sitting and all of that. That is some bad exegesis. Of course, it disagrees with what you believe. The contradiction is there, and people will say that it's not there, but it clearly is there. When Jesus said, I am the door, you think he meant he's a piece of wood? No. Why are you rolling your eyes? Because I, I don't make these assumptions that you assume that I, or that you're pretending that I assume. I don't. So I'm tired of it. I quit, quit projecting onto me positions I never held. I'm asking because it seems like it seems like you're saying if it's in the Bible. Go ahead. If it's in. Anybody say I, I, I'm oh. sorry. It cut out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You said if it's in the Bible. Well, no, because it seemed like you're saying if it's in the Bible, look, uh, he 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 has a body. Look, he's walking. He must be physical. And yet when Jesus says, I'm the door, you, you roll your eyes and say, oh, no, I don't believe that. Well, I mean, it goes with the same line of reasoning that you were using for God, saying that God had a body earlier. When, some, when it says in the Bible, you know, the fruit or the, 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 the fruit of most of the time in the Bible is talking about the, the results of actions taken or choices made. I don't expect that somebody's actually making a pie out of those fruits. I think it's only in Genesis where it's where it's uh, taken as a literal thing. Well, we know that that's a parable, and that's all it can be. So I understand when people use these sorts of metaphors. Okay. All right. Fellas. But I also understand that if it describes God as knocking at the door, and two other guys leave, there was three guys there, two guys leave, when the other guy sits down and eats, I'm not thinking that's a spirit. When he's wrestling and has to cheat by punching the other guy in the groin, I'm, I'm not thinking that's a spirit. That seems pretty explicit. They're not talking metaphorically there. They're describing a physical guy doing physical things. Are you familiar with Christophanes or the, uh, Theophanes? No. I did say that a little while ago that I have to go, and I do, in fact, have to go. So, we've had the last question. Are we done? Yeah, uh just uh just let you know <laughs> i just want to thank you guys for coming on the gospel truth and um it was a great debate and i think the audience enjoyed it and uh thank you once again i like i always do i send out gifts to to those who come on the show and debate so i'll be reaching out to you guys after the show to uh get your address and i'll be sending a gift to you and thank you guys i appreciate you man thank you much all right thank you so much i, I enjoyed this a lot more than our last discussion thank you See you later. All right, folks. It's <laughs> a good one, man. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I knew it was going to be some chuckles in this one, man, but it's all good. It was fun. Um, I always enjoy hearing the argument for the soul. Um, and it's a heavy philosophical argument. And 
And I think this is why Christians really need to just really just saturate themselves a little bit more when it comes to these type of arguments, man. These are great arguments, strong arguments for the soul. And um, I think it will help us. But it's always great to get somebody on such as Eric, who can uh, who understands these arguments and can present those arguments in a manner that the average person can understand and that we can perhaps adapt into our apologetic arsenal. Uh, to be able to use and to help in efforts to not only minister to atheists and speak to atheists, but also present that along with the gospel. He grabbed his pint, simple, sat him down and spoke to him. Use the elders in his family, the priest of Jesus, hope to him. Now I pull up on your block, where them choppers chop, chop. Drop the top and pipe the trunk and start preaching about the rock.